A street light flickers. Its warm, honey light was the only companion to be found on a twisting, cobblestone path. And when it falters and fades, only the pale glow of the laughing moon is left. Silent architecture stretches towards the skyline, each building another fang in a toothy smile. This world of darkness is nothing like the place you were before. The shadows that the light kept bay stir and awaken, creeping like alley cats from every nook and cranny. The labyrinth of sharp steel and cold brick offers no mercy. At this hour, even the jack-o'-lanterns have been blown out. There's something behind you, something shifting and churning under the blanket of darkness. You swear you hear a footstep. Or perhaps it's just the pounding of your heart. Maybe you're seeing things. Who wouldn't be driven a little mad by the pitiless night? How can you be expected to keep your head when it's a hair's breadth from being lopped off your shoulders? In the throes of terror, you can run, you can scream, you can cry, or you can laugh. Soul Eater is a series that is deeply invested in this sort of scenario. When faced with horror, how do we react, and how do we overcome that reaction? Fear, a primordial instinct shared by every living being, exists to keep us safe. Ostensibly, it's a positive emotion, and yet when cranked to 11, it can do untold damage to the psyche, permanently twist a person into a shell of their former self, and send them spiraling into the depths of depravity. Granted, that all sounds a little intense for a show that will happily spend its time on a series of slapstick skits and shower scenes. When the topic of anime and manga with psychological themes is broached, Soul Eater isn't likely to be the first on anyone's list, or come up at all, for that matter. And that's not to say the series is niche. Far from it, seeing as Hot Topic is still selling shirts with Maka's face on them in the year of our Lord 2024. It's been over two decades since the turn of the century, and much of the media from that age is reaching a fine vintage. It was the era when anime fully secured a real foothold in the English-speaking world through Toonami, 4Kids, and the Sci-Fi Channel, to name a few. So you really have a smorgasbord to choose from when looking for something iconic and decade-defining. But before we go much further, it would probably be a good idea to note exactly what we're talking about here. When we say Soul Eater, we mean the whole eater, manga and all. To really crack into the juiciest bits of character and concept, we need full spoiler privileges. And unfortunately, there's not going to be time to get bogged down in a recap or anything boring like that. Now with that out of the way, I'd like you to picture it. The year is 2008. The big three are at the height of their runs, Super Smash Bros. Brawl and Left 4 Dead are the new hotness, and a whole host of anime streaming sites have burst onto the scene to supply internet nerds with all the Japanimation they could ask for. A new darling has premiered, and its iconic opening sting is burning itself into the eardrums of emos around the world. Soul Eater is first and foremost a good time. It loves its action, its comedy, its gratuitous 2000s-era fanservice. Mangaka Atsushi Okubo excels in design and style. He does cool well. But that's not to say the series is devoid of substance. Not even a little. While never forthcoming with its greater themes, Soul Eater is still very much a work with something to say. Beneath the absurd skin of the series, motifs of connection, fear, and generational progress beat through the work like blood, rarely outright seen, but vital to overall function. A big ol' heart sits at the center of it all, and much of the overall appeal and cohesion of the story can be attributed to its guidance. The world of Soul Eater is one that thrives on interpersonal connection. The basic premise of Meister and Weapon exemplify that fact. None of what happens in the story is possible without communication and understanding between the characters, and that crucial component naturally spreads throughout the text of the series as a whole. Sure, weapons without Meisters and Meisters without weapons exist, but the circumstances surrounding them are always discussed and used to further the overall discussion of interpersonal relationships. Justin, the death scythe with no partner, is made unsalvageable by his isolation. Stein, lauded for his ability to fight without a weapon, struggles with madness, and only manages to cling to sanity through the intervention of others. It's all connected. Literally. It's all connection all the way down. That's resonance, baby! The way the overarching themes of Soul Eater flow naturally through the systems of its world is honestly masterful. I have to applaud Okubo for the attention to detail and solid buildup over the course of the series. It just works. Everything furthers the core premise in some way, but you hardly even notice it between the perfectly paced story and the delightfully strange cast. There's so much to like on the surface level that you only really notice the underlying motifs after sitting with them for a bit. At first, you like Maka for her chunky boots and long coat plaid skirt combo, then later on you realize you can relate to her struggle with self-confidence and anxiety in the face of a hostile world. It has flash in spades, but it's absolutely got the substance to back that flash up. 
Both components are what make it such a beloved and iconic series. Rather than fading into the past, it's warmly remembered by a legion of fans who are still holding out hope for a reboot that properly adapts the manga's second half. I mean, if you don't already believe me, Megan the Stallion has cosplayed Death the Kid, and for him to be featured among the gallery of classics she's shown love to says a lot. It's so easy to fall in love with the world and the characters, in no small part because visually they're so iconic. Okubo really has a knack for style, and Soul Eater is a shining example of that. But the aesthetic and ambiance of Soul Eater run far deeper than surface-level iconography. Its unique feel is not derived only from copious jack-o'-lanterns, twisted iron gates, and a grinning moon. Like icing on a cake, the visual presentation is a necessary component, but all alone a full-bodied treat it does not make. The true cake, the meat of the cake, is an intense and abiding love for all things macabre and counterculture that oozes from the series like blood from a slasher flick. Soul Eater doesn't just wear its heart on its sleeve when it comes to its influences, it's bursting at the seams with them. One would be hard-pressed to find a single chapter or episode that goes by without some sort of shout-out or reference. Horror is of course a mainstay and a favorite of Okubo's when crafting his death-centric world. A noteworthy cat in the supporting cast gets her name from found footage phenomenon, The Blair Witch Project, vampires and werewolves share a spotlight, and the aptly named horror dragon dons heads based on Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees, and Leatherface. It's not subtle, and why should it be? Halloween has never been anything if not ostentatious fun. But chilling cinema isn't the end of Soul Eater's influences. This is a rich tapestry, not single-sided homage. Characters, locales, and plot beats draw directly from wider culture. Excalibur, Baba Yaga's Castle, and Medusa draw from mythology and folklore. Jack the Ripper, Rasputin, and Al Capone are inspired by real humans who have grown into legends. And Maka Albarn herself is named after the musician Damon Albarn, who you may recognize from the band Gorillaz. Illusion is such a mainstay of the series that Soul Eater can feel like a bit of a stew, a combination of mismatched, almost contradictory ingredients that come together to make a delicious whole. While I think that description is apt, it's important that we consider the most vital piece of the meal that brings everything together, the broth. Disparate, chopped vegetables aren't sitting in a pot alone. No, they exist within a base, a central structure that they lend flavor to. Similarly, Soul Eater's tendency towards reference does not lead to a story with ill-fitting, borrowed pieces. Asura, Arachne, Ragnarok, these fragments of culture don't just exist as a film atop the series. They're bathed within the context and universe of Soul Eater. Each addition is tailored to the story, not the other way around. I mean, just look at this thing. This is not the Excalibur from Arthurian legend. No one in their right mind would mistake it as such. This creature is fully and unambiguously Soul Eater's own, while still directly borrowing from the source material. It's a reciprocal relationship. Soul Eater seasons itself with illusion and reference, but those illusions and references are at the same time steeped within the flavor of Soul Eater itself. Ultimately, they enrich the narrative instead of distracting or feeling out of place. As successful illusions, they work as shorthand. Maka comes out the gates fighting Jack the Ripper, and the pop cultural weight of that name works to instantly inform us of exactly how we should think and feel about the heretofore unexplained pre -kishin. Similarly, a sight gag using Michelangelo's David shows us Noah collects more than just monsters. The title Great Old One evokes unfathomable power, and the presence of one Gorgon sister implies the existence of two others. Oh god, no. We're not talking about that. You cannot pay me to talk about that. It's also just fun. Soul Eater is fun and compelling in large part because of its hot topic meets Tim Burton style. When I think of Soul Eater, I think of Blair sitting on a giant jack-o'-lantern. I think of cemeteries and scythes. I think of witch hats bobbing in the moonlight and Maka's big old goth girl boots. The use of pop culture in Soul Eater works on multiple levels. They're all important. Base impact of visuals and style goes a long, long way. The sheer appeal of the cartoonishly macabre is what draws a lot of people into this story in the first place. It's only later that they might appreciate the deeper work done with the myth and lore. Manga and anime are visual art forms. They live and die on their ability to charm you with their art and aesthetic. Soul Eater is no exception, and that's a part of its success. Who doesn't love Halloween? Sure, the story doesn't actually have anything to do with Halloween, but it has the same distinct feeling. Horror, but rendered as a friend rather than a foe. As space where you dance merrily aside that which is meant to scare and disturb. It's just as fun as wearing a costume, and that feeling takes Soul Eater a long way by itself. This is also a part of Soul Eater's aesthetic personality. The feeling of fun and freedom. Youthful vigor bounding about in a chaotic, upside-down world. 
It embraces the macabre and taboo, crossing the cutting edge of counterculture into its construction. The Son of Death skateboards, the kids play basketball, and are lovingly rendered in the finest streetwear of the 2000s. Baggy pants, capris, tank tops, and graphic tees. Graffiti features heavily in official illustrations, and the anime adaptation soundtrack is heavily influenced by jazz, punk, hip-hop, and quite fittingly, soul. Soul Eater was heavily influenced by the pop culture of its era, and compared to other concurrent manga, it took many cues from American culture, especially of note, African American culture. These foreign influences were melded with inspiration from the alternative scenes of Soul Eater's home country, Visual K in particular, itself modeled after glam rock, punk, and, of course, gothic scenes. The broad spectrum of rising styles and sentiments in music and art at the turn of the millennium served as the foundation for Soul Eater's magnetic, frenetic, aesthetic sensibilities. The color lent by these influences is right at home in a manga where the hopes and consciousness of the new generation are not only front and center, but put to the test and weighed with care. There's a sort of newness to it, a celebration of the dreams of 2000s youth and the growing recognition of the world they would inherit, and all the struggle that comes with the rising tide of responsibility. True maturity brings with it greater understanding of the world. The simple and orderly becomes messy and complex. Black and white turns to gray, and we're forced to grapple with the imperfections of the people and systems we may have once thought absolute. That fight can inspire fear, but it can also inspire empathy and appreciation. Why shouldn't a New World Order include that which was once outcast or taboo? What's actually to be feared, and what was only feared due to unfamiliarity or misunderstanding? The strange, unsightly, and even horrifying is right at home in Soul Eater's visual language, because fear is what the story is about fear and overcoming it, often through understanding and connection. A Spirit Halloween is the ideal place for this story to play out, as the core messaging asks us not to run from the things that scare us, but to face them head on, and even dance with them. Who better to stare down the madness of fear than students who look to mummies, zombies, and Frankenstein for guidance? What's stopping you from summoning the courage to confront the horrific when one of your best friends is death? It makes sense that some of the weakest parts of Soul Eater's narrative coincide with the temporary loss of the style that gave the story so much appeal in the first place. The Spartoi uniforms were never received well, and many cheered when the gang's original digs returned just in time for the finale. Soul Eater is a world where the macabre can and should be embraced. Why in the world would we want cutesy, school-standard nonsense? The story and characters are at their worst when the aesthetic is at its most mainstream, and spiritually, this is fitting. Blackstar isn't Blackstar without his obnoxious pomp. Kid isn't Kid without his eccentricity. And Maka isn't Maka without her nerdy, lame girl lovability. None of our heroes were ever cut out to be the popular kids. They're all weird and off-putting in their own ways, and that's the point. This is a world of the weird, of the sidelined and strange. The whole story doesn't interrogate the idea of Soul being a cool alt guy just for him to get dressed like a prim and proper shoujo heartthrob. DWMA is a collective of out there, oddball personalities, and they shine most when they're allowed to skew just as far from the mainstream sensibilities as the world they inhabit. Let Liz and Kim shamelessly gold dig. Let Ox keep his pillars. Let Patty say fuck. The parallel is never explicitly stated, but it never has to be. Soul Eater delights in fear in the same way that Halloween does. The terrifying, uncanny, and strange is rendered familiar and even fun. That which you might reflectively reject can and should be embraced. And believe it or not, that vibe is core to the series. Overcoming the base instinct of fear and the knee-jerk reaction to scorn that which we don't understand is the basis of meaningful connection that can expand our understanding of the world and pave the way for unity and peace rather than hatred and strife, and the world becomes better for it. That's the macro level of Soul Eater's championing of the connection, the belief that foraging bonds with people different from us sets humanity on a better path. And it's nothing if not proven by the end, seeing as a bond between our protagonist and the character that is the other, epitomized, ultimately saves the day. 
Soul Eater is nothing if not a worthwhile work that earns its humble place in the Hall of Fame. Not just for its captivating style or its flashy battles, and not even just for the way it legitimately warms the heart to watch these crazy kids connect with one another. It's a story that dresses the innately human in a stunning gown of whimsical fantasy and blood-pumping spectacle, and by doing so, it accentuates the best features of our species, our capacity for compassion, nobility, and perseverance. More than anything, it stands resolute in our belief that we can overcome fear. I said it before, and I'll say it again. Soul Eater is a story about fear. Trying to extract a perfect, unblemished, and fully realized theme from any battle shonen can be a, a difficult task. That's not to say the genre is brain dead or anything, just that serialization can be a bit of a nightmare if you're aiming for tight writing and thematic cohesion or clarity. A week-to-week -week format locks the author from going back and editing or refining early work as the narrative develops, and with manga living and dying by popularity, a story could end up a whole lot longer or a whole lot shorter than originally planned. None of that makes it easy to remain consistent in the exploration of one idea or the other. Can it be done? Sure, the greats are great for a reason, but not everyone can be Kentaro Miura. The unfortunate truth is that the creation of manga isn't a perfect process, and it's not uncommon for even powerhouse authors to get lost in the weeds. Look no further than some of the biggest legacy names in shonen to see what I mean. Naruto starts off as a story about how child soldiers are bad, but loses itself when it gets caught up in how cool the child soldier fights are. To be fair, how can you blame Kishimoto for giving the people what they wanted? It's not exactly easy to make ends meet as an artist. That's all to say that the deck is stacked against any mangaka when it comes to keeping the subtext and message of the story cohesive across its run. That makes it doubly impressive when a story wraps with its heart intact, and I very much think Soul Eater is a story that manages to do just that. Soul Eater is a story about fear, and more precisely, it is a story about facing fear head on. The first big tagline of the series is, A sound soul dwells within a sound mind and a sound body. A rather straightforward mantra that bids for our heroes to train body and mind in equal measure, but also sets up for exactly what a sound soul is and what a sound soul isn't. The thing these characters are meant to rally against and protect themselves from is madness, a catch-all description not just for mental instability, but a more tangible cognito hazard that exists within Soul Eater's universe. This interplay between madness and sanity, a black and white boundary at first blush, is immediately made clear to us. Maka and Soul are sound, healthy, and hale, and the pre quiches they hunt are not. A disturbed soul degrades in its madness and becomes monstrous, and when it begins to pose a threat to other souls around it, it must be exterminated. That's the order that the Shinigami oversees, and it's the duty that all of our main characters carry out. This line is presented as clear-cut, and our factions are easily sorted to one side or the other. Meisters and weapons? Good. pre -Kishin? Bad. Witches? Bad. Shinigamis? Good. A cat with magic resembling a witch? Well, actually, that's a bit harder to define. She looks like she should be on the bad side of the line, but she's not doing anything bad. In fact, she's your friend and roommate now, so good. And this, of course, sets the pace for the entire series. The line is never meant to be ironclad and unquestionable. Some of the characters may perceive it that way, but immediately the audience can see the cracks in the foundation. It's by design. It's told this way with intent. Here's the trick. Madness, the big bad of the series, is a symptom of fear, and fear is a normal human emotion. So normal that mentors go out of their way to remind the main cast that complete elimination of fear is not only impossible, but actively damaging to one's mind. Attempting to escape from all-consuming terror is what led to the birth of Ashura the Kishin, the pseudo big bad of the series. In his manic paranoia, he sought out greater and greater power in order to defeat his own fears. But this only led him to destroy the people and world around him. Anytime we see Ashura, he's absolutely drowning in horror. He never escaped it. He just became obsessed with it, in turn amplifying the very paranoia he sought to eliminate. 
There is no perfect safety, no way to shield yourself entirely from harm or heartbreak. It would be easy to craft an endlessly dismal narrative and world around this concept. Many have, in fact. There are entire genres dedicated to exploration of relentlessly oppressive and difficult worlds. But Soul Eater treats the inevitability of upset and pain as entirely mundane. People get hurt, characters have spats and disagreements, major objectives are failed and the cast is forced to confront their own inadequacy. But Soul Eater is never a story that wallows in despair. In fact, it's in its treatment of these moments that Soul Eater tends to shine. The first thing we see following the disastrous night in which the DWMA was thoroughly punked by a witch, resulting in the Keishin revival, is the gang gathering for a game of pickup basketball. It's a cooldown, not just for the audience after an intense arc, but also for the characters in the story. They're young, and they need to be able to escape from the heft of these problems for a bit. Life goes on. No one can survive 24-7 doom and gloom. It's grounding, and it's real, and in many ways, it's the sort of thing that keeps someone from going mad. Even though madness was presented as the initial dividing boundary between good and evil, the truth is that the boundary is a lot more permeable than it might have seemed. No one gets to be immune to madness, and madness, in of itself, doesn't correlate with morality. Madness nips at Stein's heels throughout the entire series, posing a constant threat and, at times, overtaking him entirely. But he's still one of the biggest heroes in the story, and beloved by his students and peers alike. Conversely, Medusa, the biggest, baddest bitch of them all, could be called perfectly sane. Madness is just a means to power and a subject of research to her. Her revolting actions aren't born of paranoia or delusion. They're calculated and performed with the utmost intent. Exploring the permeability of the border line between sane and insane is the MO of the entire series. Each of the core three Meisters, along with Soul himself, struggle with madness in their own ways. For Kid, it's the madness that goes with his desire for order. For Blackstar, it's the madness of desperation for power. And for Soul and Maka, the core heroes of the story, it's that original madness born from fear, from struggling with weakness and inadequacy in the face of a world's worth of deadly threats. Everyone gets to struggle, and through that struggle, they mature and come to a greater understanding of the world. They go from kids with simple goals doing what they're told, to teens at the cusp of adulthood. They're still characterized by the idealistic, rebellious, and hopeful energies of their youth, but they've also gotten first-hand experience with the world's complexity and the flaws of the system that they're living in. Towing the line between adult and child makes them the perfect spearhead for change and upheaval. People who aren't so entrenched in their ways as to think progress is impossible. They're willing to try, even when some might consider that its own kind of madness. Death the Kid is the series' poster child for questioning the powers that be. As the son of Shinigami, he carries a responsibility wholly unique from any of his peers. Human as he looks, the reality is that he's the progeny of the world's current ruling deity, and one day, he will become a fully realized god himself and take over that role. So it makes sense that Kid is serious and shrewd and one of the more logical of the cast. There's a lot on his shoulders, and from square one we can tell he's dedicated to becoming an heir fitting of his throne. At the same time, the humanity in Kid is strong, and his flaws and shortcomings are on full display, just like everyone else's. He's perfectly aware of who he needs to be, and the fact that he's not quite there yet, and that lends itself to his most noble and driving attribute, a willingness to question himself, the world, and the god he knows as a dad. Minus the introductory one-shots, the very first time we see Kid, he's already making his disapproval with his father's decisions known. Now, don't get me wrong, this isn't a stereotypical teenage rebellion expressed with a tired fuck you dad. It's a much more cordial and contemplative disagreement. Kid isn't a contrarian. He's not here to start pointless arguments or play devil's advocate just to get a rise out of people. It's extremely the opposite of that. Death the Kid is, in his heart of hearts, a very good boy. As much as it serves as a quick and dirty excuse to shove him into the school setting with everyone else, the first scene we see with Kid really does set the mood for his entire journey. Upon seeing the brutality of the extracurricular lessons Soul, Maka, Blackstar, and Tsubaki have been forced into, Kid objects to his father's decision to sit back and let things play out. 
Instead, he resolves to go in and save the students himself. Upon being told that a non-student can't interfere with a lesson, he announces that he'll be enrolling at the DWMA without hesitation. It's a very straightforward series of events, and yet it tells us everything we need to know about Kid. He sees what he deems to be an injustice, realizes that it's authorized under the current system of power, rejects that ruling, and decides to fix the problem himself. Even when it means throwing away the special treatment and position that would allow him to sit on the sidelines and remain removed from the violence at hand. That's who Death the Kid is. Kid is a Shinigami, but he doesn't see this as a special privilege to be enjoyed. He sees it as a duty he has to fulfill. His existence comes with great responsibility, and he doesn't shy away from that for a moment. If anything, he makes it his guiding star. His arc is characterized by constant questioning of the status quo. He's taking his role in future seriously, measuring what his father has built against his own exacting standards, and speaking up when he finds it inadequate. But that's not to say he's an utterly perfect virtuoso himself, especially not at the start. It's a good thing the brutality of the lesson is only a front, because Kid's own hang-ups prevent him from ever even making it to the battlefield, despite his previous bluster. Sometimes those standards of his are a little too exacting. Despite his willingness to criticize his father, it still takes time and no shortage of growth for Kid to fully come into his own and land on that sense of justice he ends up championing. He grew up in a world ruled by Shinigami, and just like all the other kids brought up in this system, he's internalized a lot of the status quo. Kid's arc doesn't really kick off until the bomb drop of the Kishin being sealed under the DWMA, and his sense of betrayal that his father never told him this. This is the true impetus for Kid questioning his father's actions on a grand scale. While he understands the reasons Shinigami had for keeping the Kishin under wraps, he doesn't agree with the classification of that knowledge and how it led everyone to being so severely unprepared for Medusa's attack. Eyes fully open to his father's imperfection, Kid can truly begin the quest for knowledge that will make him into a better man and a person worthy of ruling. What follows is, for better or worse, a greatest hits album of Shinigami's mistakes. To properly understand his father's legacy and the order that he's set to inherit, he has to face its history. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And there's plenty of ugly for him to sort through. The reality is, before Death was the goofy headmaster of a school for tots, he was a terrifying god that forced his will onto the world. World. No one earns the title of warlord without enacting a bit of brutality. Even if Shinigami's order is largely benevolent, its roots were watered with blood, and the stains left in the wake don't wipe away so easily. Demon weapons were born of experiments so cruel and inhumane that they had to be shelved, only for Arachne to pick up where Ibon and Shinigami left off. Witches in general were always a target of his ire, and while this is officially explained away as a necessity born from a destructive urge inherent to all witches, it's equally likely that they found themselves as targets purely because they posed a threat to the eight warlords' dominance. Stepping back and looking at the process of making death scythes brings with it some uncomfortable questions. Pre-Kishans, who have lost their humanity and exist only to kill, are one thing, but is it really just to condemn the entire sentient species of witches to the meat grinder? The blood feud between the DWMA and the witches is so emblematic of the cracks in and failures of Shinigami's system that it becomes the crux of Kid's resolution in the final act of the series. At his core, Death the Kid believes in justice, and when he sees something unjust, he can't sit back and let it slide. Just like with the remedial lesson, Kid is determined to act and to right his father's wrongs. Inheriting the mantle of Shinigami isn't the passive act of stepping into the same role his father played. To Kid, it's being handed the wheel. Power and legacy will be at his fingertips, and rather than plowing straight ahead, he intends to steer Death's order onto a better path. He can only succeed in that endeavor by learning about and accepting his father's past, even when it's painful, and even when it challenges the positive view Kid had of him. Soul Eater is a story that's not afraid to let the older generation be flawed. Parents that fail their children in one way or another are a mainstay of the story. Among the main seven weapons and meisters, no one has perfect parents. Liz and Patty's mother abandoned them, Blackstar's family left him paying for their legacy, and Maka has an absentee mother and a father who, well, we'll get into spirit later. But for all the focus on parental failure, just as often, we're shown caretakers that love their children and try to do their best for them despite missteps and mistakes. Shinigami is no exception. Even though Kid's arc is defined by questioning his father's legacy and coming to see him as a fallible, imperfect being rather than a god, there's never a lack of love between these two. Understandably, throughout his journey, Kid finds himself conflicted, angry, maybe even resentful of who his father is and was. 
Shinigami isn't forthcoming with his secrets, but he also never tries to stop Kid in his quest to find his own order. It's clear that Shinigami brought Death the Kid into existence with an eye towards his development, fully intending to let him walk his own path and be his own person. Kid got to be a kid, and then he got to be a teen, and then an adult. Shinigami encouraged him to come into his own and make his own decisions, even when that meant disappointing his son. It's in part because of Shinigami's understanding of his own past mistakes that he recognizes the value of allowing Kid to make his own share of foibles. In a world where gods rule over humans, it's probably better for those gods to have human hearts. Kid needs to have that brush with the human just as much as he needs to have his brush with the divine. Both are important parts of him, and he'll need to find a balance between those halves before he becomes a full Shinigami. Despite always having a sort of transcendence to him, it's only in the back half of the story that we really begin to see what his latent godhood really means, and how it could go wrong were it not for his human upbringing. Kid's imprisonment in the Book of Ebon leads him to encountering the Great Old One of Power, a former warlord and cohort of his father, and the incarnation of exactly what his name implies. The Great Old One of Power, who I will refer to just as Power from now on, is an odd detour in the overall journey of Soul Eater, but not an incongruous one. More than anything, Power exists as a momentary accelerant and a test of character. Its self-confinement in the depths of the Book of Ebon allows it to bestow its blessing in a controlled environment a sort of padded sandbox where the would-be movers and shakers of the universe can spiral out of control when granted the means to enforce their ends upon the world. And Kid, despite all his righteousness and level-headedness and genuine heart, is just as susceptible to the madness of power as anyone else. We get to see Death the Kid, our unflappable center of morality, at absolute rock bottom and out of his gourd as far as ideals go. All that careful consideration and research into his father's past goes right out the window, and he immediately commits to inflicting trans-symmetrical nothingness onto the world. This whole ideal is, of course, ridiculous and obnoxiously half-baked. It serves nothing but to fulfill his own basic desires and fixations. This isn't the considerate kid we know, but the kind of monster he could become if his latent power went unchecked. Luckily, he does have someone to check him. Blackstar, one of his best friends and a man who can legitimately threaten to dethrone the gods. That positive pressure quickly brings him back to his senses, but Kid's time in the belly of the beast was far from wasted. The biggest reality he has to confront is that, for all the good his father's order might do, it's ultimately a system founded on and maintained through force, often violent force. Shinigami fought his way to the top of the world, and even if he tried to become a benevolent ruler, every moving part was ultimately up to his whim simply because he was more powerful than his critics. That meant some people were cast out and labeled as evil, and that assigned impurity was ensconced and enforced under Shinigami's rule. Kid, even as a conscientious objector, was still raised within that system, and that's still his schema for governance. His entire story is about deconstructing his father's order piece by piece, then choosing what's worth keeping and what needs to be fixed. But no matter how much thought Kid may put into improving the situation, he'll always be aware that ruling by force is an option for a being such as himself. As a young Shinigami and the son of the de facto ruler of the world, he has physical, spiritual, and material advantages rivaled by none. Even before power grants him unrivaled strength, Kid wields influence and might far beyond any of his peers, teachers, or anyone else. The Kid is literally sitting on a throne when he's first introduced, need I say more? This is his natural state of being, and it's also why he's paired with Liz and Patty. Comparatively, the Thompson sisters come from nothing. Abandoned by their mother, living on the streets, and forced into a life of crime just to survive, there is no one further from the cushy, luxurious world that Death the Kid inhabits. Hell, it's the means that Kid gives them access to that convinces the girls to take him up on his offer at all. Liz and Patty don't agree to pair up with Kid out of a desire to make the world a better place, or because they want to fight baddies. It is unambiguously about the money for them. Were it anyone besides this uber-rich brat that approached them, the girls would have mugged him and moved on. At the outset, Kid is a meal ticket, and nothing more. Liz and Patty are prime examples of how the current state of the world alienates and outcasts people. They lost the lottery of life where Kid won. They were subjected to hardship and suffering, and in the name of survival, they became what the powers that be would call evil. Leading a life that showed them the worst in others, where they could only rely on the sister at their back, caused them to harden their hearts to the world. They've got every reason to resent someone like Kid, but their resentment didn't last long, nor did their intentions to swindle him. 
Kid provided for them, not just materially, but emotionally. He offered them stability for the first time in their lives. A soft place to land where they could let their guards down and open their hearts back up. He wasn't lascivious, he wasn't domineering, and he wasn't a slouch waiting for daddy to hand him the world. Upon their first meeting, Kid announced to them that he intended to create a perfect world. And over time, Brooklyn's devils realized that declaration was genuine to the extreme. Bit by bit, they opened up to him, and they realized he wasn't a spoiled brat. He's a bit of a nuisance at times, type A to a fault, and the most blatant case of undiagnosed OCD the world has ever seen. But more than that, Death the Kid is Liz and Patty's friend. Their family, even. He's the Prince Charming to their Cinderella's, a true idealist, and someone who will never sit by and let injustice play out. Kid wants to build a better world, and Liz and Patty are the first two people he invites into the world he dreams of. The Thompson sisters are the first promise Kid fulfills, and the earliest proof of his good faith and willingness to accept and entreat with people that the current world deems evil or lesser. Their influence and perspectives do just as much good for him as he does for them, whether they realize it or not. Liz and Patty constantly pull him from his woes, keep him on track, and remind him of the promise he made to himself and to humanity. They're the living, breathing reminder of his dream, and the two people he can't afford to fail. His brush with madness is an acknowledgement of the potential within him to do just that, regress and fall back onto his father's failures to adopt brutality instead of understanding, and enforce what benefits him and him alone. His recovery after a beatdown by Blackstar codifies his rejection of that path. In a way, this version of Kid is the final villain he had to defeat. The death the Kid that walks only in the shadow of his father, rather than growing beyond it. Someone who could never embrace people like Liz and Patty, or admit abject defeat to Blackstar without holding a grudge. Sure, Asura is a failed shard of Shinigami, a creation that started out much like Kid himself. But as far as Kid's art goes, facing a Sura is just a victory lap. The climax of Death the Kid's arc is the redemption of Shinigami's greatest sin, his witch hunt. The gap between the DWMA and witch society is such a chasm that the idea of even attempting to bridge it is shot down due to a perceived impossibility. There's too much blood on everyone's hands, deep as they are into the feud. That's what the older generation thinks, at least. By existing as incarnations of the current state of affairs, Shinigami, Spirit, and many others at the DWMA find the idea of peace with witches unattainable, even when they realize that it would benefit them. They see Kid as young and naive for believing it can be done, and in many ways, it's that youth and naivety that allow him to make it a reality. It's his relative innocence that lets him believe it can be done. The intent he approaches with is so blindingly pure and sincere that it forges a path for the witches to respond in kind. You may think this naive of me, but merely holding ideals means nothing. You must make the effort to realize them. If being an adult means stamping out ideas because experience says they have no future, then you can keep calling me kid. It's alright, the ship won't go down in flames. I trust the ship's pilot, I trust its operators and crew. I know it's difficult to set aside all your doubts and trust the witches. That said, can you trust me? It's only the first step, but in many ways, it's the most important one. The sins of the father weigh heavy on Kid because he chooses to feel their weight. He's fit to be a leader because he believes, and demonstrates, that a leader's first priority should be a responsibility and dedication towards the people they lead. He lacked maturity and insight, but from the beginning, his heart was in the right place. He recognized that absence within himself and moved constantly to betterment, to molding himself into the person that could create the ideal world he dreamed of. Keeping with the broader themes of Soul Eater as a work, the world is better for Kid's leadership. We don't get to see exactly how things pan out once he takes over, but the narrative has given us every reason to believe he's walking the best path. For one, witches can celebrate his elevation to true Shinigami right alongside DWMA students and staff. Their alliance on the moon wasn't a one-time thing. Kid fully intends to see the blood feud put to rest, and Maba is right there with him. This newfound peace goes a little understated with how quickly the last few chapters wrap up, but it's nothing short of world-shaking. It can't be overstated how the conflict between the DWMA and the witches was a generations-long war between the most powerful denizens of Soul Eater's world. Looking back through the series, most of the problems across the story are started by Medusa and Arachne. Particularly potent shitsters, yes, but witches nonetheless. While Medusa was condemned by her community, witch society was never particularly inclined to assist in the DWMA's efforts to stop her. And why would they? They'd never been given an inch by Shinigami. The thing is, that doesn't make them evil. Some might argue that Medusa gave the witches a golden opportunity to make an overture of kindness and friendship towards the DWMA, maybe team up before the apocalypse is looming in their sky and all that. But seriously, how could we expect them to do that? 
The witches could never be the ones to open communications and bury the hatchet. That would make about as much sense as a rabbit courting the friendship of a wolf. The reality is that Shinigami and the structures he created have a vested interest in the deaths of witches, because they have something to gain from each witch destroyed. It's not just squashing a bug. The souls of witches are extremely powerful and a necessary ingredient in the creation of death sides. Every witch killed not only lessens the opposition, it also provides them with a chance to increase their own arsenal. And really, the DWMA is likely to be more invested in the latter motivation than the former. While I've been speaking about this conflict as if there were two sides with equal organization and animosity, the truth of the matter is a lot messier. Witch mass exists, but beyond the occasional community meeting, individual witches seem to mainly be doing their own thing. Very few actively plot against the DWMA, instead treating it like a sleeping bear not to be poked. Hell, they excommunicate Medusa as soon as they find out what she's been up to. It really couldn't be clearer. The witches aren't invested participants of this war, they're victims of it. Sure, they fight back, they openly and violently hate Shinigami, and some of them dabble in experimental weapons that could pose a threat to the DWMA, but all of this is done in self-defense. Witches have been given every reason to be afraid, and as is so often the case in Soul Eater, fear is the impetus of evil. The why of the witch's behavior is constantly ignored, only the what is taken into account. So witches are violent, they're destructive, they're far too dangerous to be left to their own devices, given their boiling hatred for everything beyond their sisters. In a way, they're a lot like two other girls we know. The prickly exterior witches have grown in response to 800 years of slaughter completes a self-fulfilling cycle. Witches are seen as evil and dangerous, so witches are hunted. So witches defend themselves by any means necessary. So witches are seen as evil and dangerous. Once that cycle is set in stone, it becomes exceedingly difficult to break everyone from it. And now, I've been pretty harsh on Shinigami and the DWMA for a while now. Taking a critical eye to the existing world order is the core of Death the Kid's arc. And any good Soul Eater analysis needs a bit of witch apologia. So this hasn't exactly been the stretch for singing the DWMA praises. To have this discussion, we also need to acknowledge that, by and large, Shinigami and his institutions are benevolent and out to do good. No, we are not the baddies. But there's a lot of gray here. Shinigami flubbed it when he set the status quo, and because we don't know whether his intent was pure or wicked, all we can really do is talk about the effects of his actions in the present. When it comes down to it, witches are not the only enemy of the DWMA. In fact, they're not even the main target. There's a much more tangible and widespread threat that serves as the main focus for weapons and meisters. Kishin. In this world, you can be born a witch, or a demon weapon, or even a reaper. But you can also just be born as a normal, run-of-the-mill human. While there's no short supply of power in the universe of Soul Eater, humans are not where that power tends to congregate. We see a few talented meisters transcend their station and become forces of nature, but the average person can't even hold a demon weapon, let alone manipulate their soul's wavelength. This leaves them dependent on institutions like the DWMA to keep them from harm. That's gotta make for a pretty frightening existence. Luckily for these poor humans, if they're really hurting for a little bit of power, they do have at least one option. Consuming the souls of other humans. Pop enough of these babies down your gullet and you'll be well on your way to rivaling demon weapons. Or even witches, if you work hard enough at it. At the low, low price of your humanity, you can get the fast pass to power and follow in the footsteps of the original Kishin himself. Alright, I can't exactly prove that every single pre kishin starts the soul diet out of fear, so I'm not gonna try and claim that. But I will insist that it fits with the overarching themes of Soul Eater as a whole. In Stein's own words, it's weakness of the soul that drives one to walk the path of the kishin. You have to be some kind of twisted psychopath to start slaughtering other people, but I'm willing to believe a few healthy servings of horror can get you there. I mean, that's exactly what happened to Asura. He started gobbling in an attempt to distance himself from weakness, and, in turn, his all-consuming fear. But it never works. There is no safe enough. That's a mirage you'll end up chasing to the ends of insanity, and in the process, you put a target on your back. It's another vicious cycle, but this time, the onus is fully on the individual. Masamune is a prime example of the process. Envy and resentment over what Tsubaki inherited festered into a sense of weakness, and in the face of that perceived deficiency, he sought out power. The more souls he ate, the more paranoid he became, and the more humanity he lost. Look at this man. Look at his face. He's not happy. He's not fulfilled. He's worse off now 
loud than he's ever been, because all he can think about is amassing more power. He soothes his own fears by exploiting the fear in others, but it never lasts, and it never makes things any better. Fear and madness are very much like infections in Soul Eater, and they can be exacerbated and fed, quite literally. Attempting to escape fear by amassing power is like picking a scab. All it does is make things worse. For most, at least. All this would have you believe that humanity has gotten the short end of the stick in Soul Eater. And maybe they have. It's a terrifying world, but it's also a world they're more or less at the top of. Shinigami is the be-all, end-all, but that's one god organizing a legion of humans in the end. They're still the dominant species after all, despite their weakness. How do we square that in a world full of witches and demons? Fear is natural. For as much as it can be a gateway into madness, it doesn't have to be. Succumbing to your worst instincts isn't an inevitability. It's a choice. No one walks the path of the Kishin by accident. Killing requires intent, and so does consuming a soul. We can pity those seduced into madness or cornered by their own fear, but there's a reason they're never offered the same sympathy or compromise the witches are. Every pre kishin has chosen to take the lives of others. Their sins are conscious and reprehensible. There is no excuse for snuffing out innocent lives just to serve your own lust for power. The fact of the matter is, humans are not spineless, gutless lambs waiting to be slaughtered. They can and will defend themselves. That's the crux of the entire series. Each DWMA student, be they weapon or meister, has decided they want power. Not just the power to protect themselves, but the power to protect others as well. It is possible to walk the path of the warrior without falling into hell in the process. That truth is exemplified by our heroes, but one more than any other. Blackstar is a character defined by his relationship with power. He is driven to extremes by his pursuit of power, and in the process, he teeters on the razor's edge between control and chaos. There is no talking about power without talking about Blackstar. He's the embodiment of humanity's indomitable spirit and resolve. When you ask how humans manage to stay on top in such a terrifying world, he's the answer. But you might not believe that from the first impression he gives. Soul Eater is full of dynamic characters, and Blackstar is perhaps the most dynamic of them all. Make no mistake, he's the same guy through and through, and that resolve at the core of his being is one of the most important parts of his personality. Granted, when you first meet the kid, you might get the sense that he would benefit from a little less resolve. Some might even say he should tone it down a bit. Perhaps the most common observation Blackstar receives upon first blush is that he feels like a bit of a Naruto knockoff. He's loud, he's brash, he's a knucklehead ninja who can't help but announce his presence and fumble his missions, even though he's got a good bit of talent beneath all the goof. He's even got some spiky anime hair to really sell the look. Sure, at a base level there are some similarities, but anyone who's paying attention will quickly catch on that Blackstar is 100% Blackstar and no one else. The one fact that he insists on branding into everyone's brains is who he is and what he is. He's Blackstar, and he's a big fucking deal. He shoots himself in the foot with the sheer audacity of presentation, but there's no lie in his performance. Blackstar believes in Blackstar, and Blackstar will always believe in Blackstar no matter what the small fries around him say. This is the core of his being, the unshakable truth at the center of the soul that lets him earn the title of warrior god by the end of the series. It's the person around that solid center that develops and matures throughout the series, like a muscle thickening through repeated training. He is a man with a point to prove, and prove it he will, because at the outset, the world does not believe in Blackstar. In fact, much of the world actively reviles Blackstar. Despite claims of his own blinding brightness, the boy has lived a life overshadowed by the legacy of his forefathers, the bloodthirsty, merciless Hoshi clan of which he is the sole survivor. His blood is a poison in its own right, fixing public opinion against him no matter who he actually is. To many, any child of the Hoshi clan is destined for evil. Not a person in their own right, merely the next in a long line of monsters with no need for faces or names. And so he endeavors to prove himself, not as a son of the stars, but as his own person. Raised by the DWMA, the path to greatness was always clear cut. Power. Power enough to surpass legendary meisters, death scythes, or even the gods themselves. In a way, it's the exact thing his father wanted. So much so that Blackstar's guardians worry that he might be destined to walk the same sinful path. And that's by design. 
Blackstar is a man with something to prove, and he's not going to accept anything less than a perfect victory over the naysayers. If he compromises his star-studded standards, victory would be meaningless. If he settles for second place, he might as well be in dead last. If he's not the most powerful, then he's not finished yet. Nothing less will suffice. This is a sort of madness. There's no way around it. Just like the rest of the main cast, Blackstar has his own personal struggle with insanity. But unlike Soul, Maka, and Kid, who tend to be swayed to madness by outside forces, Blackstar brings madness upon himself, at times seeming to all but invite it into his soul. As we've been shown time and again, lust for power is the death knell of the human heart. An obsession with safety from or dominance over others leads only to ruin and a place on Shinigami's list. This boy's quest is dangerous to the extreme, and everyone knows it, Blackstar most of all. Once again, that's the point. He has to prove that he's not only better than all those who came before him, but different too. The path of the demon is a path walked out of weakness, and our boy is anything but weak. Madness will not consume him, no matter how much he leans over the razor's edge. Keeping a hold on himself is explicitly part of the challenge. There is nothing special in Blackstar's soul that makes him capable of this. He's not in possession of an anti-demon wavelength, nor is he a reaper that can casually cast off disease and poison. Blackstar is truly, deeply human, and he wouldn't have it any other way. It's an aspect of who he is as a person rather than the construction of his soul that allows him to see through his goal unscathed. It's that fervent, unyielding belief in himself. That's always been Blackstar's greatest strength. Blackstar himself probably doesn't even mean to, but by calling himself a god and a big shot, he's pushing himself on. Yes. He tells himself, there's nothing a big shot like me can't do, of course I can do it, and puts every last bit of effort into doing it. He challenges himself again and again, he's serious about surpassing the gods, he's going to get stronger and stronger. And I'd like to say that unbreakable conviction alone is enough to make a warrior god of a man, but that's simply not true. Without anything else, he would have been fated to fall to madness. His drive for power would have, and almost does, consume him. The key component that saves him from his id, and truly sets him apart from his forebears, is companionship. People to fight for, who will fight for him in turn. While his raw potential is plain to see from his first fight with Mifune, not all are privy to Blackstar's finer points. In fact, many of his peers mostly see the parts of him that are goofy, obnoxious, and self-defeating. And it's hard to blame them, considering how he presents himself. From day one, he's been shouting about how big and bright he is. And while we may know that's just his confidence talking, it's plain to see how that went over badly with the rest of his class. But on that first day, there was someone who heard his words and believed them and then continued to believe in Blackstar through thick and thin. Tsubaki, as a timid, accommodating, scentless flower, was swiftly won over by someone so unabashed and expressive. She saw everything she could never bring herself to be in Blackstar, where Blackstar saw his first supporter in her. Of course, that's not to imply their partnership is lopsided, not even a bit. Tsubaki may have been Blackstar's first fan, but that doesn't mean he doesn't respect and support his weapon in equal measure. Blackstar provides Tsubaki with all sorts of vicarious expression, a vessel through which she can make herself and her will known, which is ironic considering it's usually the weapon that allows the Meister to express their wavelength. Tsubaki has been stifled her whole life, burdened with guilt and propriety. A twist of fate left her shouldering a legacy that she was never supposed to have, that inheritance estranging her from her brother that she loved and spent her entire childhood trying to make room for and connect with. Even still, her existence drove him to madness, and the one thing to put him out of his misery was to express and insist upon herself. That doesn't come naturally to Tsubaki, so she needs someone like Blackstar to bring that side of her out, to let her be loud and big, often with him as her conduit. How could she not support him then? How could he not truly be a star in her eyes? He may not show it, but Blackstar has always craved that sort of acceptance, and he really needs that sort of positive attention from someone in order to keep going. Wholeheartedly, Tsubaki believes in her Meister, and that lets her Meister believe in himself all the more. That fleck of weakness and need in Blackstar's soul is made all the more apparent in the chunk of the story following the Kishin's resurrection, and ending with the defeat of Arachne. Everything begins to unravel when Ashura is released, and Blackstar is not only forced to feel insignificant in the face of a shifting world, 
but he's also bearing the acute pain of guilt over it. He had a chance to stop the Kishin, and he utterly failed. This is the flip side of Blackstar's utter confidence shown in excruciating motion. He only sees his goal, and he moves towards it no matter the cost. It's because he pushed himself past his limits that he fumbled a clear shot at the Black Blood while Erika attempted to revive the Kishin. Further, the moment he proclaimed that his dull sixth sense would protect him, he'd already lost. He believed in his own words a bit too much and was blinded because of it. And he tries to make up for it. He, he really does. Immediately, he attempts to atone for his sins by taking on Ashura directly, only to be swiftly put in his place. It's a double whammy of Black Star ego destruction. Just like all his friends, he was forced to confront his relative weakness when faced with something ancient and evil. But unlike his friends, he can't in good faith claim to have given it his all and honestly flunked. He made a critical error at a critical moment, and he can't think of the Kishin's revival as anything but his fault because of that. This starts Blackstar on a steady decline, one that's only intensified by his second loss to Mifune soon after. Tsubaki may have been Blackstar's first fan, but Maka was his first friend. They grew up together due to their close ties to the DWMA. For all his boasting, Blackstar isn't entirely self-centered. He cares immensely for the people in his life. When Maka is bedridden with extended paralysis, Blackstar is once again powerless to help her. Unable to come to grips with this, he does the only thing he knows how to do. He picks a fight. But that fight, once again, ends in defeat. Bitter defeat, given that the Osamurai was, up until now, taking it easy on him. At this point, Blackstar doesn't just have a chip on his shoulder, he has the whole damn tree. Consistently, he's found himself too weak to win, thus, the clear solution is to get stronger. So Blackstar does just that. He locks in, he trains, he gets quieter and colder, and he focuses on power above all else. To his credit, he puts in the hours. But at the same time, all that sweat pouring from his brow is watering the seeds of madness inside him. His tunnel vision is beginning to estrange him from the rest of his life, and his sanity along with it. He gets in fights with Maka. He stops bringing Tsubaki into combat. He becomes belligerent and detached and grows less recognizable by the day. He spirals so far that he's one of the souls that pings on Joe's radar alongside Medusa and the Little Demon when the man is searching for madness resonances within Death City. That's not a list you want to be on. It's terrifying to watch Blackstar on this warpath, and not even Tsubaki can pull him out of it. All he wants is to get stronger, to prove what a human can do. He's become so blind to anything but the pursuit of power that he refuses every hand outstretched to him, and so it takes a heel to knock him back to reality. Death the Kid has been the guy to beat ever since Blackstar first met him. Really, he's the perfect candidate. Not only is he tough as nails and skilled as they come, but a literal god. For a man who intends to transcend humanity and become a god in his own right, Kid was always destined to be the ruler that he measured himself against. But more than that, Kid is Blackstar's friend. They may not have gotten off on the best foot, and their sensibilities are as counter as they can be, but that has never stopped the two from respecting each other and building a solid rapport. Soul Eater as a story is all about conflicting and complementary personalities and the strength found in bonds between them. Kid doesn't just take on Blackstar because he's sick of his attitude, but because he's worried about him. Kid's a Shinigami. His entire life is centered around quelling the spread of madness and nipping pre in the bud. He's uniquely suited to understand the dark places Blackstar's heading. So as a friend, he takes it upon himself to force Blackstar to rock bottom before he can sink any lower. He speaks in the language his friend understands and beats the shit out of him. Kid shows him how worthless this bid at power has been, and he tells him straight out that he's disappointed and that he needs to get it together. Lo and behold, it works. Blackstar eats his slice of humble pie and realizes that all he's really been spiraling towards is ruin. Raw power does not a god make. That's just a monster. What's the point in such massive power? What does one hope to gain by wielding it, and what's the cost? Blackstar's story has always been defined by power, and now he's forced to reckon with how hollow, bitter, and messy power can be. Blackstar is the champion of humanity in Soul Eater. He attains this rank through his quest for power, so it's only fitting that through him we see an interrogation of power. The idea has become so vague and abstract at this point, a goal rather than anything with concrete meaning. Power is the strength to defeat your enemies and make your mark. As we saw with Kid, power is also the ability to dominate others and enforce your will upon them. 
up to and including death. Mastering the martial way means combat. It means getting hurt, doing harm. It means pain, destruction, and death. That's the promise of power, and the sole expression it knows. To rule with power is to rule with the explicit threat of violence. It is not empathetic or compromising. It is blood, and it is viscera. It is tearing flesh from bone and snuffing out the flames of lives. The existence of pre Keishans and Soul Eater is an explicit decree. Killing others is self-mutilation. Your soul rots alongside the corpses you've left behind, stripping away sanity bit by bit until the thing left behind forfeits humanity entirely. This is the path of the demon, and a path that Blackstar comes very close to walking. It's his bonds that save him from it, and instead he matures and chooses to understand the power he covets before attaining it. He communes with the Nakasukasa spirit, the original family of demon weapons and the inheritor of all the bloody history that goes with their existence, and he allows himself to feel the despair, fear, and sorrow of everyone else that has slipped down the path of the demon. The path he intends to walk is no wider than a thread strung above that hell, a feat impossible to achieve without looking down to steady his footing. If the sight below him, the immeasurable suffering of all those who have fought, killed, and died in the name of power, would shake him, then it's not a path he could ever walk. Confronting that pain, understanding its reality, and neither shying away nor falling into it is what allows Blackstar to rise above and become the warrior god that rivals Ashra at the series' conclusion. He's still the loud, haughty boy we know and love, but he gains maturity and a deeper understanding of his own actions. In the end, his goal is the same as it ever was, but his movement towards it is nearly unrecognizable. There's a sense of recognition, if not respect, that he brings to his battles. That's not to say he still won't loudly proclaim his intent to beat your ass, but this time it's someone that knows what he's talking about, instead of an obnoxious, oblivious child. By now it's pretty clear that power and madness are explicitly connected in the world of Soul Eater. Like with Masamune and even Blackstar, madness tends to follow the accumulation of power, as if the outcome of a Faustian bargain. It's only natural that our characters face off with that beast as they climb the ladder, and oftentimes they're better for the trial. Dipping their toes into a bit of madness might let them resonate with previously unreachable adversaries, or temporarily give them a power boost, but the insanity itself is never a boon. It's always a hazard that threatens to punish overindulgence with utter destruction of the psyche. In that way, it's another case of self-perpetuation. Fear, stress, and despair breed madness, but madness also breeds madness. Even dipping a toe into river rapids puts your whole body at risk of being pulled in. And that's the real danger here, losing yourself to a torrent you can't seem to escape. Madness twists the soul and the person along with it. What makes madness so awful is the way it destroys the people it gets its claws into. It's a perversion of the mind that over accentuates a human's most basic survival instincts and desires while attributing delirious joy to any action taken. The fear is on, the brakes are off, and the consequences don't matter. It's the absolute opposite of thoughtful introspection or respect for others. That makes madness isolating by nature, a rejection of the savior called connection. If you no longer mind hurting others or constantly fear that they're gonna hurt you, the only choice is solitude, violently enforced, if that's what it takes. You lose your mind, your body, and anything you might care about. It's no wonder that madness is treated as an ontological evil in the world of Soul Eater. While we do have direct agents of madness in the clowns, it doesn't require a vector for infection. The mind and soul can just break. It can be stress, despair, loneliness. Any negative stimuli in abundance can lead one to madness. It's a hyperbolic representation of the human condition. Of course we praise fortitude. Those that can endure an onslaught of pain and poor fortune are thought to be particularly strong but not everyone can take the blows as they come, and very few can manage bad fortune indefinitely. A human is a weak creature, lacking claws or fangs. We can't escape underwater or take flight when frightened. Our base state is vulnerability, and the hyperdeveloped brains we use to overcome that physical weakness leave us susceptible to emotion and mental pain in ways many other creatures are not. Madness is a parasite specially tuned to prey on that weakness. It nests into the folding gray matter and eats until the host stops thinking and gives themselves over entirely. Most people aren't Blackstar or Death the Kid. 
They aren't superhumans who can fight their way out of fear. The vast majority of people must contend with their weakness, and in a world that can be as hostile and disorienting as Soul Eaters, that causes no pittance of fear. This is where pre quiches tend to come from. Helplessness and paranoia. Lust for strength and a guarantee of protection. It's why the DWMA has to exist. Not only to clean up monsters when they do arise, but also to provide some sense of security. But for however much weapons and meisters can hack away at fear, there will always be an abundance of it, and its roots will quickly regrow into a bramble. When power is the only chance at a true release from panic, it's easy to understand why humans will corrupt themselves into monsters time and time again. Blackstar represents the best of humanity, those with the resolve and heart to attain power without losing their minds in the process. But the reality is that most will end up like Masamune if they attempt the same. So is Shinigami's endless culling of their bloodthirsty souls the only option? In a sense, it is. There's a reason why Kid seeks to amend and improve his father's order, rather than tearing it down entirely. There's no permanent cure to fear or madness. Even Shinigami's attempt to rid himself of those emotions failed, resulting in the birth of the devil. Everyone else, nowhere near as mighty, is left with a seed of madness within them, an omnipresent threat of losing themselves entirely. Fear, pain, madness, the Sword of Damocles hangs precariously overhead. Concerned as the story is with that looming dread, it inevitably answers the question of how one is meant to cope. And it's the same way we've been watching our heroes battle darkness from the very beginning. They're able to stand tall in the face of horror because they're not alone. The very nature of the Weapon-Meister relationship means there are no solitary heroes in Soul Eater. The very act of holding a blade is communication and cooperation. Once again, it comes back to that basic human premise. A task that might be terrifying alone is rendered bearable or even mundane by a bit of company. Walking through a forest trail at night alone? No thank you. I'm gonna be shivering in my boots and working myself into a panic. Walking that same trail with a friend? Well now that's a pleasant outing. Making the very heart of the series simple colloquial wisdom is incredibly effective. To start, the message Soul Eater is trying to convey is a fundamental truth of human experience. Asserting that you can find strength and courage through connection with others isn't a shocking or controversial position to take. Maybe there will be a few edgelord detractors, but give them a few years and they'll grow out of it. Second, keeping the core theme simple means less time needs to be spent trying to convey or argue it. That means allocating more time and energy to explorations of that main idea. And that's exactly what Soul Eater does so well. Humans that turn into weapons and create a power-enhancing feedback loop with the people that wield them is kind of a wild premise, but it works because the relationship engine it runs on is so immediately understandable. That lets us focus more on how varied and complex those bonds are, and further, how the world itself is a series of interconnecting, crossing, and shifting relationships. A bit like a spider web, if you will. And that's not entirely novel. The push and pull of interpersonal relationships is the framework of many a series, but they aren't typically action in genre. Soul Eater has world-ending conflicts, but they're always made personal. Medusa is the biggest antagonist of the series, and she's got a whole toxic romance going on with Stein, while also being mother to Krona, which makes her cruelty personal for Maka, who ends up working with Medusa to take on Arachne, who is her sister and a would-be lover to the Kishin, who is the bastard son of Shinigami and therefore a brother to Death the Kid, and on and on and on. It goes fairly understated, but there's a lot of personal drama in Soul Eater especially in the realm of families. As a work, Soul Eater quietly has a lot on its mind about the strife within families, which is right at home here, since family bonds are the first bonds anyone has. They're not just a bedrock, but an inevitable point of conflict on a micro scale. Even loving families fight, and that's saying nothing of not so loving families, which are heavily featured in Soul Eater. It pairs naturally with that sub-theme of passing the torch from one generation to the next. Not every adult goes out with grace, and the kinds of relationships they have with their children can be a big part of it. Those early connections and conflicts tend to set the stage for how a child spirals outward socially. A schema is formed by their relationship with their immediate family, creating a sort of essential shape of love. That shape becomes a template, a mold for what a bond should look like, for better or worse. As a human grows, it's only natural that their understanding of such things will progress and change over time. 
In the best case, those taught a damaging or sickly version of love will rise above their upbringing and be able to healthily connect. But that can't be done without the give and take of others. Every connection augments that initial mold bit by bit. The shape can change completely, it can become utterly unrecognizable from where it started. But it still started there. And those first connections linger like ghosts. Sometimes the ghosts of childhood help, and sometimes they haunt. The memories engraved on the heart inevitably influence the life one leads. Ultimately though, that life is yours to do with as you please. Whether you bore up in this world in joy or sorrow, the journey from child to adult is marked by the attainment of freedom and choice. Even so, freedom is terrifying in its own right for something as small and vulnerable as a single human being. The world is too vast to ever fully be known, and stepping out into that expanse brings with it no shortage of trepidation. We're dwarfed by the scale of it all, and in the ignorance of youth, we all make mistakes. It's indescribable just how much it can mean to have the support of others. People who will say, I've got you, and be there for you even when you're weak and even when you're scared. Soul Eater is a world full of terror. Ghosts, witches, the blood dripping moon itself. But despite every horror on the list, the hell inside your head still takes the crown. Madness preys upon insecurity, jealousy, panic, and every other negative side effect of consciousness. When even your own mind can be the enemy, it's important to know that someone is by your side. Black Star and Death the Kid, as lovely as they are and despite their bouts with madness, have a bit too much security to drive home the point of the series. That job falls to Maka Albarn and Soul Eater Evans. They have no genetic advantage, no indomitable spirits or Shinigami bodies. Maka and Soul bear a weakness unique amidst the principal cast, and that's what makes them the heart of the story and the rightful heroes. After all, they have more reason to be afraid than anyone else. And throughout the story, their fears are often highlighted as emotional cores in each of the arcs. Rather than having singular goals like perfecting the world or becoming a warrior god, Maka and Soul grapple with smaller scale challenges that change with their place in time and space. Sure, the premise of the series was always making Soul into a death scythe, but that's achieved roughly halfway through, and it's almost never at the forefront of their concerns. Instead, the arc Maka and Soul traverse is defined first and foremost by powerlessness and all the understandable fear and despair that go with it. Those volatile, gnawing feelings are made tangible by Soul's infection with Krona's black blood. Really, it's an elegant metaphor and narrative Swiss army knife. The black blood is a devil on Soul's shoulder, a symbol of Maka's failure, a voice to Soul's woes, and any number of tensions within their greater relationship. It's as flexible as it is sticky, grand as it is mundane, and useful as it is deadly. It's the perfect tool, both inside and outside the narrative. The Black Blood is also notably a tether that keeps Sol and Maka in the orbit of Soul Eater's cagiest character. But it's not time for Krona yet. We'll get to you, baby doll. The beauty of Maka and Soul is how thoroughly human they both are. They're flawed, weak, and scared, often in very ordinary ways. As great as it is to cheer for Black Star's godhood or kids' development of a better world, there's a special sort of significance that comes from watching the main duo overcome smaller, more personal hurdles. After all, connection is the lifeblood of the series, so striving to understand the woes of your weapon can be just as important as saving the world. It can be what saves the world, even. To really appreciate what makes these two work so well, we need to understand the baselines of who they are, warts and all. And why not start with Shonen's premier shoujo, the one and only Maka Albarn. When it comes to this duo's hot and cold opposites tracked appeal, Maka is the straightforward of the two. In many ways, she is what she says on the tin, an honor student striving to follow in the footsteps of her amazing mother. She's willful, practical, and one hell of a hard worker. She wears her heart on her sleeve about what she likes, and especially what she dislikes. And while some might say she doesn't give a damn about the court of public opinion, others would allege she simply has no sense of style. Soul, on the other hand, is her perfect opposite. He's especially sensitive to the tastes of others, and he uses that sixth sense to curate a cool guy appearance complete with motorcycles, casual leans, and a go-with-the-flow detachment that makes him utterly unshakable. He'll welcome shortcuts and isn't afraid to lie to get his way, but he's just as quick to lay down and take whatever misfortunes come his way instead of fighting back. On paper, they seem primed to hate each other's guts, but the key isn't where they clash, it's how each complements the other. The strengths of one make up for the weaknesses of the other, and this is prominent from day one. Soul, unwilling to strive for much on his own, is galvanized by Maka's go-getting attitude and endless drive. 
She's not just the one that reminds him to study, but also the one who compels him to care about anything at all. Soul, on the other hand, provides the flexible, cool-headed approach to life that Maka, in all her type A glory, can't even begin to fathom. But there's still plenty of room for the two to bicker and fight. They're not a perfect pair. If they were, it would ruin the whole point of the series. In their first real battle against a zombified Sid, Maka and Soul pull off their very first resonance, a special move born of perfect alignment between Weapon and Meister. And quite blatantly, resonance is in part an allegory for the bonds between two people. Its power, form, and stability are unique to the pair it's born from, making it an effective means of externalizing the immaterial heart of a relationship. It also serves as a handy measuring stick. Even though Maka and Soul are able to perform a witch hunt slash, the move quickly goes awry, leading the duo to bicker over who's at fault for their failure. And this is pretty much perfect for the beginning of the series. It sets a baseline, establishes the work they've done so far, but also provides a roadmap of where they need to go. Neither fully understands the other, and that's okay. Disagreement is to be expected. This is something Soul Eater does consistently well. There's always room for error and conflict within its relationships. Not just between Weapon and Meister, but between parent and child, sister and brother, lover and lover, or friend and friend. Disagreement and difference are natural. They aren't a death knell in the slightest. A legendary anime once emphasized the hedgehog's dilemma and the pain that goes with it, but Soul Eater's ethos takes those moments of conflict and considers them to be opportunities for understanding and growth. Unexpressed feelings turn to resentment or despair. Endeavoring to be the perfect person or partner means hiding and denying your true self. It's better to have a big blowout fight and pummel each other in the face than to shy away from conflict entirely. Only one of those options gives the other a chance to understand your feelings. More than any other pair in the series, Maka and Soul wear their conflicts on their sleeves. They struggle to express themselves and develop anxieties concerning the other. But at the end of the day, they communicate and forge common ground through empathy and compromise. After all, you can only dance by facing each other head on and trusting your partner, even if they occasionally step on your feet. At core, Maka and Soul are both anxious in their own right. Each has a means of attempting to cover up their fears. For Maka, it's by dedicating herself to excellence, usually in the realm of studies or extracurriculars. For Soul, it's a cool guy facade that allows him to emotionally detach from everything that might hurt him. That they're so grounded in comparison to Kid and Blackstar is, paradoxically, what makes them stand out. While we can cheer for a Shinigami on the brink of inheriting the world, it's much easier to empathize with a pair of students struggling with turbulent emotions. The basic level of intimacy their relative normality grants bolsters our ability to understand the way their emotions shift and progress throughout the series, and their resonance acts as a measuring stick to show us how far they've come as a unit. When it comes down to it, Maka and Soul both grapple with the same kind of fear, a fear of rejection, of not being good enough. That fear shapes their personalities and coping mechanisms, but it also shapes their relationship, acting as either a wedge or a binding depending on the day. Their main arc throughout the series is kicked off by that shared fear being dredged up to the forefront of their minds. Meeting Krona in the Santa Mario Novella Basilica is the pair's first brush with something unfathomably beyond their capabilities. Sure, being a student at the DWMA always came with the risk of bodily harm or death, but prior to today, Maka had been a model student and a remarkably adept Meister. She and Sol had probably taken a few hits here and there, but nothing like this. It's unambiguously a brush with death, their first time truly teetering on the edge. Their first battle with Krona leaves Maka and Soul scarred, metaphorically and literally. Maka faces not just failure as a Meister, but what that failure actually means. She was too weak, and she was almost killed for it. Soul was directly responsible for her survival, acting as a model weapon and protecting his Meister no matter the cost. While Soul's chest will and does heal, he's left with an infection that invades both mind and body. The Black Blood not only physically exerting power over him, but leaving him with an inner critic. And that's his worst fear, someone who knows who he is and who he can't hide from. Even though both recover and resolve to keep moving forward, the planting of these fears is far from inconsequential. Those clashing aspects of their personality come into full focus here, and their next big fight against Free sees the two falling apart at the seams. Despite the similarities inherent to their anxiety, Societies, they have very contradictory approaches to handling those fears. Hard-headed and endlessly driven Mako works herself up into a fury, putting the whole of her focus onto the idea of getting stronger. Something is bothering her, so she wants to tackle it directly. Soul, meanwhile, would rather push down those feelings and act as if they don't exist. Sure, getting stronger is a good idea, but getting so gung-ho about it means acknowledging that that feeling of incompetence is there, and acknowledging it is what makes it real. While Sol is attempting to hold a door closed, Maka is pushing against it with all her strength. It's an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object. 
The only solution here is compromise. They have to open that door and face each other. Maka needs to borrow a bit of Sol's cool, and Sol needs to match a bit of Maka's care. Unsurprisingly, this will often be the solution. Taking a step back, listening to each other, and finding a place to meet in the middle. As we've seen time and time again, keeping your feelings bottled up and getting too in your own head can have dire consequences. Black Star is at his worst when he self-isolates, and Kid's mission is dead in the water if he can't listen to and empathize with others. The ideas here are pretty universal, and that's not really surprising. Soul Eater is taking the very basic concept of companionship and exploring it from a plethora of angles. So, of course, when things begin going really, really wrong on Christmas Eve, Maka and Soul are able to win a small but impactful victory amidst a night of failure by moving with that principle of connection rather than using brute force or avoidance. Krona is an enemy they can only defeat through connection. First their own, and then by forging a new connection with Krona themselves. It's a very quick and efficient turnaround on a lesson learned. Exactly what one would expect from star student Maka. You can't help but give your girl an A plus here. And the bond she forges here will be another major piece that defines her arc throughout the story. While she and Sol both have slow burns in their characterization and development, immediately we get to see a new side to Maka that Krona excels in bringing out, her sweetie pie side. Really, we get to see the kindness come out of the whole cast, as alongside Maka, they recognize how beat down and scared this poor kid is. It's like they've communally adopted adopted an abused puppy, and it brings out the best in everyone. The friendship these kids have been fostering throughout the last six volumes really makes itself felt, and those connections are so warm that they melt right through Krona's fears and slowly change them into someone who can let themselves be truly and lovingly embraced. And it's just as wonderful as it is agonizing, because it doesn't last. Krona seemingly betrays them and leaves Death City, and Maka is left with her next crucial lesson. Yeah, sometimes your ego will hurt your relationships and you have to choose to compromise, but sometimes... Sometimes it's not your fault. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. That's a tough pill everyone has to swallow at some point. But it's especially tough for Maka, who suffers so much from a feeling of powerlessness. Once again, the enemy was too much for her. She was the perfect friend, but that couldn't free Krona from years of abuse and manipulation by Medusa. Once again, everything she had wasn't enough. While Sol isn't as wounded by this turn of events, it's clear that he feels for Maka. He welcomed Krona as a friend, but this is Sol, a cool guy who is chronically unable to open up to and welcome people into his heart. Look at his friendship with Blackstar. Sure, they're total bros, but their relationship lacks real depth and intimacy. They get along, but Sol still unconsciously rejects Blackstar when the assassin tries to wield him against Kid. Connecting with Krona wasn't something he was up to the task of, so he supported Maka from the sidelines instead. And that's where he also gets his lesson in weakness and fear. Maka's the one person he's opened his heart to, and the real, genuine soul is an empathetic and kind person. He might not show it, but he's grieving right alongside his Meister. Even more than her, in some ways. While Sol and Krona don't share the emotional bond that Maka and Krona do, they have a glaring similarity. The Black Blood. Maybe it wasn't the blood itself that led Krona to betray the DWMA, but the parallel has already been drawn in Sol's mind. If Krona is incapable of shaping up and beating their demons, maybe he isn't either. He sandbags and snarks the little devil in his head, but at the end of the day, he's terrified of everything that freak says. He's scared there's something wrong with him, that he's inherently aberrant and unworthy. That's the whole reason he hides himself in the first place. Of course, the black blood now being a part of him, a decidedly wrong part of him, doesn't exactly allay that fear. Medusa made the black blood in the first place to resonate with madness. Her end goal is turning Krona into a kitchen. Sol, who already struggles with inferiority and shame, now carries within him a condensed liquid of ontological evil. There is no cure. He's tainted and unable to be made better. In his eyes, this is confirmation that he was right all along. Sol Eater Evans is no good. It's to be expected that the black blood enmeshes itself with the core of Sol's pain. The form it takes is a grand piano. At first, this seems innocuous. Sol has always been a music guy and seems to have a particular love for the classics. So why shouldn't it be a piano? We already know he plays. Maka told us that when she and Sol first met, he played piano for her, specifically with the intent of expressing who he was. While it surely imparted something, the full breadth of what he was trying to communicate was lost, because he's scared to explain himself. 
Telling someone why he doesn't want to play the piano is, in his mind, the same as admitting that he's inferior to his sibling. Sol may be talented, but Wes Evans is a prodigy. He could dedicate himself to music and practice every single day, but he'd still never match up to his brother. He just doesn't have what it takes. What's inside him is inherently worse, and there's nothing he can do about it. This creates the bedrock for his approach to problems in general. If trying means you might fail, it's better not to try at all. That's a painful and sad way to think about yourself in life, but it's the reality of who Soul actually is. The cool guy act is a means of deflecting from that pitiful core. It's a facade that plays double duty, allowing him to project charisma while remaining detached and emotionally uninvested from everything and everyone around him. That way, no one gets close. No one sees how miserable and worthless he is. From 20 feet back, all anyone can see is a stylish and laid-back demon scythe. No one gets to come any closer. No one gets to glimpse the untalented, unmotivated boy underneath. No one gets to hear him play piano. No one except Maka. And that's because Maka is the one thing in the world that inspires Soul and allows him to have any belief in himself. She'll be impressed when he plays no matter what, and that's nice, but it's not the part of her that compels him. Maka puts in effort every day. She strives to attain her dreams through hard work instead of inherent talent. She faces failure head on, and sure, she cries about it, but it's never the end of her world. She always gets back up and redoubles her efforts. That's unthinkable for Soul, and that's what draws him to Maka. He gets his jabs in, but he's also her most ardent supporter. He's a shoulder for her to cry on, and a shield for when things get tough. He'd gladly sacrifice himself for Maka because she's the one thing in the world that convinces him of his own value. He'd rather die in her stead than live without her, because without Maka, he goes back to feeling like nothing. The nobility Maka sees in her partner at these moments is very much a result of her influence on him. He might be the social star between them, but when it comes to core virtues, Sol admires Maka and wants to live up to her example. It's ironic, Sol's cool guy act is so good that for a long time, Maka doesn't even realize this in the slightest. Humorously, it's part of what makes them such an excellent pair. Both can see what the other has that they lack. They can see so clearly how the other makes up for their weaknesses and cares for them, but all the while, they discount and grow anxious over their own contributions. In turn, Maka is painfully aware of her own plainness in comparison to Soul's style and popularity. Glitz and glamour never came easy for her, and she has a bit of a complex about not being much of a belle. Usually this manifests as the classic teenager move of turning up her nose at popular trends, and deciding she's superior for valuing knowledge and more cultured pursuits. But it's on a backdrop of undeniable self-consciousness. Soul is cool personified. He keeps one finger on the pulse while the other is thumbing through a collection of the classics. He's a certified dreamboat in the eyes of many girls at the DWMA. He's a damn good demon weapon to boot, and he makes it all look effortless. Soul excels at projecting an appealing image, then he backs that image up with legitimate skill and popularity. It's only natural that Maka might wonder why he chose to be her partner when he seems to have everyone at his beck and call. That feeling is compounded by a very real fear of abandonment. She spent her entire childhood catching her father in the act of cheating on her mother, and that eventually destroyed her parents' relationship. Worse yet, her mother, the parent that Maka saw as the good and just one, left. It's an understandable move, given that Spirit is so deeply connected to Death City, but the effect is still the same for Maka. Her mom left her behind. Maybe Maka had the chance to go with her, but how could she be expected to make that decision when her dreams and self-worth are so tied up in her identity as a Meister? That's all gonna leave a mark, and not just the standard kind. Her father was a demon scythe, and her mother his Meister. Her own setup with Soul is an uncanny reflection of her parents. That's bound to dredge up some baggage now and then. Sure, she makes some jabs about men being scummy near the beginning of the story, but overall, Maka does a pretty incredible job of not letting her family trauma poison her relationship with Soul. That said, she does have a few moments of weakness. Most prominently, the final chapters of the Book of Ebon. The Envy chapter goes straight for the heart with Maka, highlighting everything we've just covered before going in for the killing blow. Now that Soul is a death scythe, Maka isn't really necessary anymore. Soul can have his pick of the litter, and Maka can easily be left in the dust. You may be the Meister who made Soul into a death scythe and everything, but that doesn't mean you're the right one for him as a partner. See? That's exactly what I mean. You're crude. What could possibly make you think you're the right one for Soul? The thing is, I know the truth, Maka. The only reason you've been able to make it as far as you have is because Soul's carried you the whole way. Soul's been carrying you on his back the whole time. It's like you never even bothered trying to get to know the real him. Take music, for example. You don't know anything about it. It's bad enough being jealous of Liz, but being jealous of music itself? You really are stupid. 
Look at all the girls who'd give their right arm to be Sol's partner. You might want to think about putting in some effort for a change before he wises up and tosses you out on your rear. In many ways, their showdown with Giriko and Sloth is the climax of their relationship. This is the moment wherein both are laid bare to the other. They finally put words to the insecurity they feel, and they express how much they've always looked up to and relied on the other. The trick is, of course, that it's all been mutual from day one. They were the perfect pair from the very beginning, but they were kids who lacked the courage to confront their fears, or the maturity to communicate them in a healthy manner. Once again, it's those grounded and truly human emotions that make these two shine. Sol and Maka are the stars of this story not only because they're the weakest of the trio, but because their true strength lies in facing and accepting that weakness. Their core virtue is courage in the face of madness and terror, not a denial of fear, but an acknowledgement of it. Once Sol and Maka have reconciled and recognized each other in full, there's only one thing left for them to do. Confront and tame that foreign agent that's been trying its damnedest to tempt Sol to evil. And really, it's a wash for the little goblin. Sure, Sol loses himself during a battle within his mind for a minute, but now that he's fully torn down his walls and been embraced by another person, the fodder the black blood has to throw at him has dwindled to nothing. He can't be scared into submission anymore. He's his own master, and he knows that if he slips up or falls, Maka and the rest of his friends will be there to catch him. They love him completely, not for his pomp and style, but for him, for Soul Eater the Death Scythe. And he loves them too. Connection has always been the strongest force in Soul Eater. It's the basis of Resonance, and of the DWMA as a whole. The amp and guitar are both weak on their own. It's only together that they can rock the house. These characters rise and overcome their weaknesses through forging bonds with unlikely friends, through showing compassion to the outcast, by reconciling old, frayed bonds, and by embracing those closest to them at their best and worst alike. Maka and Soul overcome their weakness through the bonds they share with each other and all the other people living alongside them in the world. It's no wonder their greatest ability works through connecting and resonating with souls via Maka's soul perception and soul's music. That they fully come into their own and finish such a core part of the arc by the end of the third act is a bit jarring, but it also makes perfect sense. Now that Maka and Soul have reached perfection, they're ready to redeem that one bond they lost long ago. But before we talk about Maka's dearest of friends, we gotta finally address something. Now, if you're a diehard fan of Soul Eater's manga, you may have noticed that something was a little off with that last section. I made the claim that Maka not being special was the crux of her character, and then didn't talk about a wrinkle in her soul that does make her special. Or, if not special, very very rare among the general populace. One in fifty million, to be precise. Maka has a Grigori soul, a soul that takes on the appearance of wings and can allow one to manifest wings under certain, highly difficult to fulfill conditions. In practice, this allows Maka and Sol to fly in the second half of the story after Sol has become a death scythe. It also gives third act villain Noah a bit of a reason to target Maka's soul, but this doesn't totally pan out. Which is unsurprising, since the Grigori reveal ushers in the weakest era of Soul Eater, and in so doing, becomes indicative of it. And like, it's hard for me not to sympathize. The start of the third act puts Okubo in a really, really tight spot after what has largely been a perfectly paced run. Baba Yaga's castle has been invaded, Arachne is dead, Dead, and arachnophobia dissolves. The villains we're left with are Medusa and the Kishin, but having just come off of an incredible high of action and payoff, now isn't the time to pursue those high-value plot threads. The last time the story came to a point like this, we got a cooldown with Basketball, and the introduction of some new allies that had been hinted at since the beginning. In many ways, a flawless one-two punch. This time, we get the Grigori reveal and the militarization of the DWMA. I want to be very clear, neither of these choices are egregious. The Grigori business was actually solidly foreshadowed in the artwork, and Death City battening down the hatches after a death the kidnapping makes logical sense. But on both fronts, the feeling is still all wrong. Maka shines because she can overcome fear despite being a normal, weak human. She makes up for her lack of any special traits with hard work and dedication. That's her whole thing. But for her to suddenly get a free pass to the special boy zone cheapens who she's been up until this point. I'm already willing to believe Maka and Soul would find a means of resonating wings on their own. Why do we have to give her some mythical trait to make that happen? Worse yet, the fight Maka and Soul have over the wings is a petty rehash of their early squabbles, something that feels utterly out of place after they deepened their bond defeating Arachne. It's an empty calorie plotline that momentarily hollows out the flagship duo, and all the while the turn of the narrative is estranging Soul Eater from what made Soul Eater so great to begin with. 
with. Yes, the DWMA has always been a special forces unit, but the huge shift into militarization here is jarring. Maka, Soul, and the whole gang go from feeling like up-and-coming youths fighting for truth and justice to full-on child soldiers. In essence, there isn't much of a difference, but the tone and presentation quash the vibe. Where we once saw the kids hanging out, throwing parties, and studying for exams, now we see them receiving special combat training. The emphasis on connection and interpersonal care gets flattened under the boot of Spartoy, and the new uniforms are the icing on the cake. This is only my opinion, but to me the Spartoy outfits are dull and drab, where street fashion, morbid flair, and individual style once shown, conformity and a bland, shoujo-esque sensibility now reign. Maka has been turned from a preppy goth with big honkin' boots to a marketable cute schoolgirl. Soul's no longer a button-clad wannabe biker, now he's a standard Otome love interest. And there's just something so depressing about that. Soul Eater's style was one of its biggest hooks, a work that delighted in counterculture and the macabre was like a breath of fresh air. You can argue, and I already have, that the odd and at times off-putting styles and personalities within are central to Soul Eater's ethos. So why have they been scrubbed to a bland landlord beige? Soul Eater lost itself in its third act. It forgot who it was and what it was about, and the story and art suffered for it. Now, Okubo managed to right the ship in time for the fourth and final act, for the most part. But that doesn't exactly make Soul Eater a manga without its share of flaws. At this point, I'm gonna assume you believe us when we say we love this series. No one writes 30 pages of character and story analysis without a heaping of passion. But true appreciation comes from being able to recognize the faults in something you love right alongside its virtues. The truth is, a fair bit of trepidation came with the start of this project. Soul Eater holds a special place in our hearts, and that's due in large part to it being a very early anime for both of us. It was one of the first really amazing things we ever saw, and it'll always have those accolades for impressing us early on. But that also means grappling with the fear that rereading the series as adults would cause it to lose a bit of its previous luster. That fear was intensified by the way our opinion on author Atsushi Okubo have soured since Soul Eater's conclusion. Okubo is talented, no doubt, and Soul Eater did hold up far better than expected. So much so that many of our early notes are us expressing our amazement at the progression and the pacing of the story. It was really great, but he also has always had some interesting tendencies, and those seem to have only gotten more pronounced over time. How do I put this? He's a bit of a gooner. Soul Eater was a mid-2000s shonen, and some of its more risque moments are par for the course. They're genre trappings of the era that were encouraged in order to keep the target demographic, young boys, entertained and coming back week to week. Some gratuitous boob and butt shots are gonna happen. It sucks, but it also is what it is. Fan service sells and all that. At the very least, once you get past those first three one-shots and into the story proper, the titillation angle simmers down, but it never disappears entirely. At base, that's not a bad thing. Getting a little randy is part of the human condition, and portraying that in any kind of art isn't a moral failing. It's sincere expression in its own right. I'm not about to sit here and advocate for total chastity and modesty. This, this ain't a damn Bible camp. However, that doesn't mean that all fan service is created equal. It's not as if we can neatly cleave down the middle and separate the good from the bad, but we can certainly interrogate what can make a scene genuinely unpleasant and off-putting, and how those scenes can end up detracting from the work as a whole. Let's start with a question. Consider these two scenes. What's the big difference between them? Why might we consider one permissible, if not an absolute joy, while condemning the other? What it comes down to is a question of framing and agency. Blake Blair is nothing short of a fan service character. She's the certified titty committee of Soul Eater, and there's really no issue with that. It comes down to a matter of taste. She is aware of and in control of her body when the audience is being invited to get a kick out of her curves. Hero, on the other hand, is assaulting his classmates. The intended effect is the same as the Blair scenes. It's a flash of something scandalous and stimulating. It's meant to be a cheeky moment of fun for the audience. I hope this isn't an unpopular statement, but I don't really find young girls having their consent violated and being humiliated to be sexy. It's actually really cringy to watch scenes like this. Cringe. There's no other word for it. This makes me cringe. It's embarrassing. Stuff like this makes me feel ashamed to recommend Soul Eater to my friends. I warn them about it in advance. I feel like I have to apologize for sharing something that I love. And that's in part because Soul Eater, especially early on, is littered with these sort of sequences. Female characters are groped, harassed, and flashed in scenes that make their discomfort clear, and we're meant to nod along and enjoy it. But it's juvenile and cruel. Who the hell wants to see characters we're meant to like be hurt and exploited? And even if you want 
to write that off, many of Soul Eater's moments of fan service are actively detrimental to its characters. It's like they get possessed by the spirit of Okubo to become vessels for him to do some inane, drooly shit that would only excite a teenager. One instance of this follows the above hero scene, wherein Sid, someone who, may I remind you, has always been characterized as being a dedicated teacher who deeply cares for his students, validates Hiro's harassment of the girls and entirely fails to take their concerns seriously. That is not what a good and caring teacher would do. Another terrible offender comes at the tail end of the series. Death the Kid, dear, precious, practically asexual Death the Kid, is used as an excuse to get the camera into a shower that Kim and Jackie are taking, under the flimsy guise of rushing them out the door. This is the same kid whose entire arc has been centered around empathy and listening to the plights of others. Your Honor, he may not be my character, but I can say with certainty that he would not fucking do that. This is what I mean when I say Okubo's perversion undermines his work. Not only does it make them unpleasant, it sacrifices the solid characterization that's been built up throughout the series for cheap thrills. It's made all the more disappointing by the instances where Soul Eater does it right, because once again, Blair is our star player here. She actively performs for the camera and can be used excellently for a bit of levity and fun. Conversely, when you take a serious moment and flip it a full 180 just for a bit of sex appeal, it makes the scene and the characters within feel hollow. How can we be expected to take any of this seriously when you, the author, won't even do that? These pitfalls are at the core of what has soured us so much on Okubo over the years. If you're a longtime fan of this channel, you might remember a video we made about his next work, Fire Force, and perhaps the shitstorm in the comments below. While Fire Force has many compelling elements, it's kneecapped by Okubo's worst tendencies. The goonerisms that occasionally peeked out in Soul Eater are roaming the streets here in full force. To make matters worse, he seems to have completely forgotten how to write women between projects, leading to a slew of characters that are thinner than cardboard. Like, these girls are literally just archetypes. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. They literally are archetypical. That is a plot point. Speaking of which, don't even get me started about some of the caricatures Okubo uses in his work. His portrayal of a couple of marginalized identities in Killick and Krona, for example, are admirable, they're great. But some of the minor characters of color just don't hold up to that standard. Look at India's death scythe. Okubo, as your lawyer, I am begging you to stop posting. The quality just isn't there. It boggles the mind to think this guy went from writing a well-rounded, entertaining, and incredibly human character like Maka Albarn to Tamaki, a girl who exists purely for the purpose of graceless, distasteful fan service. And to be fair, the male characters don't get a whole lot deeper. The work is just a bit, it's kind of weak. Fire Force has a killer aesthetic and a lot of really interesting ideas, but it lacks the overall cohesion, thought, and execution of its predecessor. I mean, Soul Eater is remembered for being a fun show with a delightfully Halloween-y aesthetic, but Fire Force isn't strong enough to escape being overshadowed by its most infamous scene. You probably know the one. The part where Okubo uses a flawlessly logical child to epically own a hysterical screaming female about how the author is actually super smart for dehumanizing women at literally every opportunity opportunity, all the while stroking himself off for being such a genius writer of meta-commentary. It's really embarrassing to read. You just know he thought he did something here. And then everyone clapped, level posting. And sadly, it's not even just Fire Force. Prior to Soul Eater's conclusion, Okubo started releasing Soul Eater Not, a side project set in the same universe, but following different characters in a more slice-of-life format. It's adequate, if nothing else, but it suffers from that same lack of depth as Fire Force, and it ends up feeling more like a harbinger of the dark future and Okubo venting his sexual frustrations. Of course, it's all catering to the sensibilities of 13-year-olds, as per usual. Stepping back, you have to wonder, what the hell happened? Soul Eater isn't exactly a psychological thriller or a grinding character study, but it has salient themes that interconnect throughout the narrative, and it has characters that make for compelling protagonists while tying back into and championing those ideas. To tell you the truth, Okubo's subsequent works degraded my belief in him so much that I was kind of worried this video might turn into a hit piece. I was scared that I was just a young, dumb kid back then, and Wizened Eyes would reveal Soul Eater to be nothing more than a middle-of-the-road work that I had a lot of nostalgia for. 
It's hard to say how I feel now. Clearly there's substance to Soul Eater. None of this analysis is made from whole cloth, and that should be apparent if you even have a passing knowledge of the series. The story has depth and cohesion. The characters have enough internality to grow and change as they learn more about the world and the people around them. I came out of this read sure that Soul Eater was a work with merit. More than that, it's, uh, it's a damn triumph. It has its faults, but it sure as hell earns its reputation, and the plentiful love people have for it, even to this day, is a testament to that. And so, I'm forced to wonder, was it a fluke? Was this an infinite typewriter situation? How could someone backslide so dramatically over just a few years? It's hard to square, but ultimately there's no real answer to be found. I don't know what Sushi Okubo, I just like a comic he made. My guess would be that he spent a lot more time planning and plotting Soul Eater than he did his other works, but once again, I I don't know for sure. All I can really do is accept that he lost his touch and segment off my appreciation of Soul Eater from his other works. It's a little sad, but at this point, I've had ample time to make my peace with it. And it wasn't as if things changed overnight. As discussed earlier, the story starts to get shaky in the third act, and it does manage to recover towards the end, but there are still noticeable cracks. Not was written concurrently with the last stretch of the main series, and Soul Eater itself had kind of a stinker of a final chapter. Shonen aren't usually known for having perfect conclusions, but there's something especially disappointing about wasting half of your last chapter on an extended joke about boobs. This man just couldn't keep it in his pants long enough to finish the story with grace. But despite the things it did wrong, Soul Eater is still overall a worthwhile work. It stumbles, but it pulls through and finishes the race with its greater themes intact and its characters satisfyingly brought to the end of their arcs. Soul, Maka, and Blackstar have all reached the climax of their individual stories by the time they hit the moon, and Kid joins them shortly after. Fighting Asura is more a victory lap than anything else. By the final volume of Soul Eater, all the gang has left to do is save the world. They've already completed each of their journeys. All except for one. There is simply no talking about Soul Eater without talking about Krona. At the same time, Krona can be a bit difficult to talk about. Their part in the story is complex, dynamic, and it defies boilerplate narrative roles. Krona could be considered a deuteragonist, but they share that niche with Soul, Kid, and Blackstar. They spend large portions of the story as an antagonist, but they spend just as much time as a true ally to the cast. The most fitting way to describe them is as the Sasuke, but calling them a rival still feels like a stretch of the imagination. Depending on your perspective, it might be more fitting to call them a damsel or a love interest. But then again, Sasuke was both of those things too. More than anything else, Krona exists to be the other side of the coin for Maka, the antithesis to her thesis. Almost every aspect of their being runs counter to our protagonist. Where Maka is bold and stubborn, Krona is timid and spineless. While Maka enjoys a wide web of connections, Krona is detached from the world around them. Maka is weak but forges on with courage, and Krona is powerful but trembles with fear. Both characters are intentionally crafted to contrast each other, and this makes them play together incredibly well. Their deliberate creation even draws on Soul Eater's homage to horror. Baggage aside, women and genderqueer people are particularly prominent in this genre as protagonists and monsters, respectively. It's only fitting that the central push and pull of the entire narrative would come from a duo matching that description. This interpretation gains more depth for those who see shades of romance in their relationship. They bring to mind classic creature features in which a heroine is pursued by the titular monster. Think King Kong or the creature from the Black Lagoon. This time though, it is lovingly turned on its head. Here, we have the girl as the incessant pursuer. With Maka and Krona's bond being abjectly positive, it even manages to be a bit ahead of its time, breaking into more contemporary trope of a heroine and a monster mutually falling for each other. The juxtaposition between Maka and Krona is perfectly placed at the center of this story, seeing as Soul Eater is a narrative that also grapples with ideas of exclusion, othering, and the grayness between good and evil. All of our heroes have taken turns dipping in and out of madness throughout the story, and Krona repeats the same action, but they come at it from the opposite side. Krona starts on the side of madness and dips into stability, then returns to madness once more. In doing so, they allow us a means to contrast the two states further. Where our protagonists find power and a corrupting freedom in madness, Krona finds companionship and happiness in sanity. That makes it clear which is the path to walk, but it also makes it all the more heart-wrenching to watch Krona lose that fleeting comfort and acceptance. 
If Maka, Soul, and the gang are the thesis on the strength of love and connection, Krona illustrates hell born of isolation. Figures like Masamune and even Ashura are sympathetic. We can understand how fear pushed them to unspeakable ends, but they're ultimately responsible for their own suffering and bloodshed. Krona, however, is a true tragedy. Krona did not choose to walk the path of the Kishin. Their fate was already decided when they were born. As we've discussed, Soul Eater as a work has a lot to say about the relationships between parent and child, and the differences between generations. The story features mainly well-intentioned guardians who suffer from their own flaws, but understand their shortcomings enough to gracefully pass the torch to the next generation. Shinigami and Tsubaki's parents make the top of the list as parental figures that understand they've failed in the past and mostly act as cheerleaders for their children's independent development. More in the middle, you've got Spirit, someone who desperately wants to be a good father but has hurt his daughter immensely and can't quite break out of the habits that soured their bond in the first place. And at the absolute abysmal rock bottom, you have Medusa, two-time winner of the Abuser of the Year Award. Medusa may claim to be Krona's mother, but her treatment of them couldn't be further from maternal. Krona is not a beloved child. They are an experiment and a machine. They were brought into this world not to live, but to be shaped into the perfect vessel for a Kishin. Their upbringing was a linear, fenced-in path, and they were brutally punished if they ever strayed from it. Medusa needed Krona to be scared, ruthless, and isolated, and she made sure Krona grew up to be all of those things. I think it goes without saying, but this is not how you treat a human being, and there is no excuse for, nor love, within Medusa's actions. She's not raising a child. She's forcing a child into the mold of a Kishin without concern for how much flesh she has to hack off to make them fit. So by the time Maka and Krona meet, Krona has already endured a lifetime of terror. As soon as they were big enough to hold a sword, they were taught to kill, oftentimes cute and helpless things just to smother any latent pity within them. They were forced to let another being, one that actively and aggressively harasses them, cohabitate in their body. They were horrifically punished and deprived of food and water when they refused. Krona did not choose to become a killer, they were made into one. All the kindness in the world can't undo that programming overnight, and in fact, by the time they meet Maka, kindness is something they've been so alienated from that it's become strange and upsetting to receive. They never experienced love without strings attached. Every good thing Krona has ever received has been conditional, and failure to meet those conditions has been met with cruelty. Of course it's going to terrify them when Maka offers them understanding and empathy. Even a defenseless rabbit can be made an object of fear under Medusa's sway, and Maka herself is no exception. This is the witch's supreme triumph. By making herself Krona's sole external connection, and so deeply poisoning their relationship, she has groomed Krona into instinctively fearing any and all hands held out to them. The basis for love Krona was made to understand is this. Other people are scary. They are the sources of pain and pressure. The only way to eliminate that fear is to cut them down. The only way to cut them down is to be stronger than them. It's the perfect textbook recipe for the creation of a Kishin, and in turn, the perfect counterthesis to Soul Eater's core assertion. The reality is, not everyone gets an equal shot at life. Humans are born into a vast array of circumstances that play a major role in shaping their disposition, outlook, and future. Sure, some people are born into wealthy, adoring families, but most don't enjoy that kind of privilege. Even those with loving parents can still end up scarred by dysfunction, and that will hinder their ability to connect in some way or another. Growing up alone or rejected can harden you to others and leave you with complex feelings and behaviors that others might not want to deal with. So much can go wrong and it can scare and scar you, leaving you fumbling in your interpersonal relationships. The desire to get close to someone is omnipresent, but expressing that openly and sincerely is one of the most terrifying things imaginable. Connection requires vulnerability, and vulnerability requires bravery. And for those children born into hateful and abusive homes, how can we fault them when their fears have been cranked up to 11? How could we ever refuse to sympathize with someone who has been taught that even a fleeting flash of vulnerability will result in pain? Krona is the perfect figure to play parallel to our heroes, because they are the deep-rooted fear of connection made manifest. Not as some cackling villain with inscrutable, destructive intent, but as a scared kid. Krona's humanity is laid bare through their fear. They're one big raw nerve, and that makes them an open book. Krona may stand as a wolf among hares, but emotionally, they've always been the frightened little bunny. Their walls are made of glass, and that visible pain moves us to befriend them, and it moves Maka too. And the really important thing is that she succeeds. 
It's by no means an easy task, but it's possible. Putting herself into a state of madness is a straightforward act of empathy. She's all but literally placing herself in Krona's shoes in order to understand them. The black blood gives Sol and Maka a bridge that they can use to resonate with Krona, and resonance has always been shorthand for interpersonal connection. The sight that greets Maka is predictably sad. Krona's soul is likened to a dried up beach, nothing but sand and bone. There's no life-giving water to nurture them because no one has ever provided them with love or care. In spite of all that, it's not as if Krona is fundamentally broken and entirely unable to learn how to understand themselves or others. What it comes down to is you just can't give a direct answer to someone else's questions, so you sit here like this and ask yourself questions to try to keep yourself sane, right? If this keeps up, you won't even be able to question yourself, don't you think? Do you think sitting there worrying like this is going to get someone's attention? So does that mean you haven't even noticed that nobody's interested in your problems? When you cut that bunny and made your first kill, how did it feel? You were relieved, weren't you? You'd found an opponent weaker than yourself. Ever since you started thinking that way, you haven't had any doubts about seeking power like Medusa told you to, right? You've gotten pretty strong now. Did it get rid of the hell inside your head? Their conversation with their shadow is woefully revealing. Krona's a whole lot more self-aware than they seem. Anxiety is always at the wheel, so it's rare for this more introspective side of them to come out, but it does exist. They know they're only hurting themselves by pushing the world away, but they're too scared to do anything about it. The path of least resistance may be a path of pins and needles, but the devil they know is better than the devil they don't. They want something better, they want to connect, but they're too afraid to pursue something beyond their experience. All they've ever learned is pain, so they expect pain from the unknown too. It seems safer and easier to stay in the little world they know, even if that means constant bleeding. But Maka proves that the borderline marking the bounds of their world is less than paper thin. It's entirely imagined. In a way, this is Krona's worst fear realized. The terrifying outside world has invaded, but it doesn't hurt. It's nice, actually. For the first time, someone reaches out to Krona with empathy and kindness, a dream they had secretly held this entire time. Maka brings rain to the barren desert and Krona cries. For the first time in their life, Krona is allowed to cry and be vulnerable without being punished for it. They get to experience the basic human comfort of being consoled through their pain and sadness, and it changes the trajectory of their life forever. Prior to this moment, every single second of Krona's existence has been painstakingly engineered to breed misery and fear. Ragnarok and Medusa, the two people they've been allowed to have in their life, have taught them that connection is toxic. They've been groomed to perfection for the role of the Kishin, and yet all it takes is a hug and a handshake to bring them into the light. A decade and a half of training to reject connection flies out the window the moment they're shown love, and that's really the point of Soul Eater. No one is ever too far gone to be saved by love and companionship. Despite all the work Medusa has put in, Krona is still fundamentally changed by a single hand held out to them. They're not beyond help here, nor are they beyond help when they've literally melded with the Kishin at the story's climax. There's still humanity inside Krona, and it can always be reached. But that said, as far as a bit of love goes, it's not a magic spell that instantly negates all previous suffering. Endeavoring to explore human relationships means showing more than our finest moments. Just like everyone else, Krona has the baggage of the life they've lived and the parent that raised them. No one is immune to the pitfalls dug out by trauma. Soul detaches for fear of being rejected, Maka worries that she'll be abandoned if she fails to be good enough, and Krona… Krona has deep, deep damage to contend with. During their time at the DWMA, they're met with more warmth and kindness than they know what to do with. The whole gang makes an effort to befriend them. Teachers trust them to go on missions, and they get to be a semi-normal kid for the first time in their life. It's wonderful and exactly what they need, but it can't delete years of abuse. Medusa returns and it all comes crashing down. She's able to manipulate them like a marionette because she's literally got abusing her child down to a science. It hurts to watch. Krona is in such clear pain, and the viewer gets to feel betrayed right alongside Maka. It's impossible not to ask why they would do something so awful. As much as it hurts, this is a triumph of Soul Eater's storytelling. The effects abuse has are complex and messy, especially given the severity of what Krona endured. Remember that they were taught their whole life to reject connection, and that people would hurt them. 
a fear ingrained that deeply can't be shaken off in a matter of months. All Medusa had to do was talk to Crona and convince them not to snitch. That foot in the door let her label them as a betrayer, and after that little sin had taken root in Crona's mind, it could be leveraged not only as a wedge to drive them away from the DWMA, but also as a means to further ravage their heart. Expert snake that she is, Medusa managed to paint over the halcyon days of Crona's life and smear them into a horrible, damning memory. Crona is led to believe that their actions are entirely their own and proof positive that they're unable to foster connections. They were the one that failed to alert the DWMA to Medusa's presence. They were the one that lied to their friends, and they were the one that chose to infect Marie with a snake. Do you see it now, Crona? Do you see what you're capable of? This is the birth of a new fear, one that cuts their hearts to ribbons if they so much as think about it. The fear of hurting those they care about, and the weight of having already done so. Back in Medusa's palm, they're easily convinced that the only viable option left is to mash their heart into oblivion and sink deeper into numbing madness than they've ever been before. Despair experienced after happiness is twice as potent after all. Medusa is the only one left, and she's mercifully offering them a sedative. The trauma incurred by separation from Maka and all the others that offered Krona love and acceptance is the perfect primer for the culmination of Medusa's meddling. They've been brought to levels of instability heretofore unknown, skyrocketing their affinity for madness and causing them to double down on their own self-isolation. That's exactly what the witch wants, and all that's left is to sever their final tether. For all the gloom and terror, Soul Eater tends to be a light-hearted work. It dances with the macabre rather than cowering, and its omnipresent focus on love and trust tends to keep the tone from becoming dismal or disturbing. That said, this is a work about fear and the dark places it leads to. There were always bound to be a few exceptions, and it shouldn't be surprising that one of those exceptions is rock bottom for the embodied antithesis of Soul Eater. This whole time we've been told that evil is sharp teeth, shadows in the night, and mutterings of demons. We weren't prepared for true darkness to don the mask of domesticity while tearing out our jugular. A perfect parlor, pictures on the walls, a home-cooked meal. These should be the drapings of happiness, but when inhabited by Medusa and Crona, they look deeply, horribly wrong. The wickedest witch of them all smothers her child with simple, everyday love, and it makes our skin crawl. It's picturesque, the type of reconciliation that comes at the end of the story. A beautiful moment of familial connection and peace. It makes us want to vomit. In return for years of hard work and loyalty, a recognition of their suffering, a thank you, and a hug. The bitch had it coming. She really, really did. That's the worst part, because we don't get a chance to enjoy it. This is a hollow victory. In fact, it's not even that. There's nothing to celebrate. After an entire series worth of rumination on the complex but meaningful connections between parent and child, there is absolutely nothing comforting about a child ripping their mother to pieces. There's only pain here. Overflowing, overwhelming pain that bursts from Krona in the singular language of violence that their parent taught them. Medusa spoke in punishment, not praise. Medusa cultivated ruin, not domesticity. Medusa did not embrace, she hurt and Krona reacts just as Medusa always taught them to. From the very beginning, every single action was calculated. A terror campaign of almost two decades has culminated in bloody butchery and the complete destruction of Krona's psyche, and it's exactly what Medusa wanted. All of this was designed to push Krona past a final breaking point so that they could completely cut themselves free of earthly attachments and become a god of mayhem. Medusa has raised her perfect child. There is a resounding sadness in Krona's entire existence, but in this moment especially, the weight of a life built of torment and abuse bear down on them in a singular instant, and not only do they kill their own blood, but amidst the screaming, they mourn the only thing that ever made them happy, Maka. This entire time, they've been carrying that little fleck of joy that connection brought them, unable to forsake the memory of their friend. Maka's compassion cut through their chest and stabbed straight into their heart. In the same way that Soul was infected by the black blood, Krona was fundamentally altered when they were shown love. Despite the pain accumulated from betraying and leaving the people that were kind to them, Krona experienced love, and everything was different after that. Once again, it brings us to that classic idea of the hedgehog's dilemma. Krona could be a testament to the ways that intimacy and connection can go awry and tear us apart. Medusa sure tries her damnedest to turn them into that, but instead they tear down the argument entirely. Connection is a lot more complex and nuanced than a couple of critters shivering in the cold. The moment that Maka entered Krona's soul, she became a star fixed in their heart. 
It was more than a single person being kind to them in the moment. It was the consecration of a truth that would haunt them forever, that they could be loved and that they were capable of loving in return. The Krona prior to that moment ceased to exist, and with them went the ideal Kishin that Medusa had been trying to create. It was akin to the fruit of knowledge. In a single pivotal moment, Krona was forever changed and unable to return to what they had once been. They were born mortal, but this is what made them truly human. I'm making it out to be almost divine in scale, but it truly was that simple act that saved Krona and the whole world along with them. Resonance between Maka and Krona, a connection that gave rise to belief and courage, allows them to conquer fear itself. In the end, no amount of strength will ever be enough to dispel primordial human instincts that cause us to look over our shoulder or jump at shadows, but all those imagined terrors become insignificant if we have someone by our side. All it takes is a hand to hold our own, and the things that frighten us lose their power and sway. It's not so scary walking in the dark at night if someone is by your side. There's still a tragedy in Krona's end. They choose to stay behind, bidding Maka and Sol to make their escape, and in doing so, render the Kishin vulnerable to their sway. After so much torment, this reunion feels all too fleeting. And in many ways, it is. It's hard to imagine Krona being left behind and parted from the person that made them whole. But that's not what's happening. Krona isn't going anywhere, nor are they forfeiting their life. They're just staying on the moon for a while. Really? Krona's soul has its place among the melody soul weaves from everyone in the world, and that connection is going to persist long after Maka and company return to solid ground. The bond they share isn't so weak as to fizzle just because of a little time or distance. It persisted when Medusa was trying to sever it, and it'll persist as long as Krona needs. They aren't ready to join everyone else just yet, but someday they will be. And when they are, their friends will be waiting for them. There's a moment early on in Soul Eater where we're taught what constitutes an irredeemable action. Sure, the first episode and chapter tell us that Kishin are evil, witches are forces of destruction, and madness is a point of no return. But this story spends so much time blurring the lines and wading through the gray of hard and fast rules that by the end, everything on that list has been met with exceptions and caveats. Kim's been our friend from the start, and Death the Kid reconciles with greater witch society. All of our heroes succumb to madness at some point or another, and they come out of those episodes as stronger, more mature people. Even Justin Law, a man who is best known for betrayal, murder, and general douchebaggery, is offered a second and even a third chance at redemption, just because someone out there cares about him and wants to believe that he can still make a face turn. This is a man who, by Shinigami's own rules, should have been executed on the spot. But odds are, if he'd made the effort to turn over a new leaf, the DWMA would have worked things out with him. Strict black and white morality doesn't work long term. It's something you can only really enforce through brutality. If a few mistakes get you marked evil forever, you're gonna lose a lot of good people. If there's no chance at redemption, you miss out on discovering how wonderful someone might become. There has to be room for forgiveness, and there has to be a path to redemption, but that doesn't mean everyone gets a second chance. There's still a point of no return in Soul Eater's thesis. It's the night of the anniversary celebration that we get confirmation of what true evil actually is. Shinigami and the student body are trapped. Our star trio is in hot pursuit of the Black Blood, and the Stein-Spirit combo are hanging back to take care of Medusa. Moments ago, Maka's fight with Krona came to an end, and the Demon Sword Meister made their first friend. The warm and blinding light of this moment of love gets contrasted with the deepest, blackest darkness, as Medusa labels her child a failure and nonchalantly plans to throw Krona aside. It's not the most startling thing we've seen. Really, it's an understated moment. But it still brings spirit to tears. Despite being locked in a deathmatch with a witch, he leaves weapon form to express his utter horror at what she's said. And he does it really poorly. He barely stutters out a full response, too overcome by his own tearful rage to rebuke her with any substance. But that's enough. He shouldn't have to flawlessly defeat her in debate for us to understand just how debased her attitude is. This moment comes early, but it tells us one important thing. Medusa will never be redeemed. That she can think and talk like this without batting an eye is a testament to just how rotten and truly unsalvageable her soul is. Her treatment of Krona wasn't the result of a lapse in judgment or misguided virtue. It was sustained, consistent brutality. It was calculated cruelty, the purposeful warping of a child's mind so that they would never feel safe or loved. And when you think about it, her crimes are twofold. 
Ragnarok wasn't exactly winning friends in his appearances, nor does his treatment of Krona make us want to sympathize with him. But he was still a person at some point. A kid, most likely. A kid who was forced to transform, melted down, and injected into someone else's body. I can't even begin to imagine how that complete loss of agency and self would twist the mind. It doesn't make his treatment of Corona any more palatable, but abuse is complex, and not every child is going to end up the perfect, lovable victim. Ganging up on Corona might have been what he had to do to survive. That's not an excuse, but if we're championing the power of connection and compassion, he should get a slice of the sympathy pie too. Blood child or otherwise, these were kids in Medusa's care, and her treatment of them was so heinous that she barely deserves to be called a mother. The witch has committed the most cardinal sin in a world of connection. She's sought to corrode those bonds from the start. The relationship between parent and child is complex, both in reality and in Soul Eater. The very first connection you have is with your parents, and that connection becomes your basis for interaction with the wider world. The love a child is shown by their parents sets the tone for the love they'll show others, and the love they'll be shown in return. How could we ever forgive someone for intentionally poisoning that bond? A child might grow up to question their parents, or detest them, or resolve to throw off their legacy entirely. Those are all within their rights. But no matter what, it's a parent's responsibility to show their child love. They should be able to trust that regardless of how much they disagree or fight, when everything's falling out of alignment, they can always depend on the people that brought them into the world. Anything less is unforgivable. American psychologist Harry Harlow's 1958 study, simply named The Nature of Love, has gained nearly mythological status in the modern day, but its premise and results are very real. As the study concludes, baby rhesus monkeys, when separated from their mothers and presented with two surrogates, overwhelmingly chose the soft, comforting cloth surrogate over the cold, hard wire surrogate, even when the wire surrogate could provide food and the cloth could not. The human psyche differs little. We crave connection and comfort, and that craving remains with us from cradle to grave. Humans are social by nature. Our bonds with others, imperfect though they may be at times, will always be a vital form of sustenance for the soul, sometimes more precious even than food or water. It's when we're isolated that we find ourselves susceptible to the whisperings of fear and madness. A little bit of love can go a long way to pulling us from those depths. Be that love a hand held out to us, a shoulder to cry on, or a swift kick to the head. As long as there's someone that cares, we're never truly lost. Lights shine brightest in the depths of darkness, and it's often in our worst moments that we come to understand just how much the bonds we share with the people around us matter. No one has to be perfect, just being a friend is enough. Everyone's bound to slip up, falter, and make mistakes. Soul Eater is nothing if not a championing of the good inside everyone despite their failures. What matters most is that they try, that they all care about each other, and they do their best to be a friend when it's needed. I'm sure we can all think of times when people dear to us have said the wrong thing, or done a bit of harm, or just generally made a fool of themselves. But we still love them regardless, right? The same is true for you too. You don't have to be perfect to be worthy of love or able to connect with others. Cut yourself some slack. When you fall down, take a deep breath, stand up, and find within yourself the courage to move forward and try again. The ultimate root of fear is the unknown, and so the best way to allay our fears is in endeavoring to know and endeavoring to be known. It takes courage, but one of the best things you can do is find it in yourself to be vulnerable, and give the people around you the chance to truly and deeply know you. The pursuit of understanding allows us to detangle and differentiate between what's actually dangerous and what's just different. And in exploring those differences, we're presented with new perspectives, new feelings, and chances to grow. At its core, this is what Soul Eater is about. Communication, compassion, and connection. Witches aren't so scary once we recognize their humanity and hash out our differences. The anxiety we might feel over expressing ourselves to the people we care about can easily be dispelled with a bit of honesty. Even the true monsters of the world aren't so hard to face, so long as you've got a friend by your side. Fear is something we can never truly erase. Any attempt to do so will only lead to madness. It's only by accepting fear that we can find courage. And with a bit of courage, we're capable of superhuman feats. It could be as grand as ending centuries of war, intimate as putting an end to the cycle of violence, or as simple as reaching out to hug someone who's never known kindness. First comes the compassion to understand, then comes the courage to act. Ideals without action are meaningless, but so too are ideals without perspective. Learning how to exist in the world and connect with others is a lifelong endeavor. It's not something we ever truly graduate from. The moment we decide we're done growing is the moment our world begins to stagnate. Even if we all grow old and culture begins to pass us by, the best thing we can remember is to welcome the new and embrace the strange. If we ever truly close ourselves off, we're done for. 
We need connection to live and thrive. It's through forging bonds with others that our world brightens and expands. That understanding and the light that comes with it is what expels the shadows of the unknown and quells the seeds of madness in the soul. Resonance isn't something we experience alone. It's the sound we make together. Thank you so much for watching until the very end. This is a Halloween project we've been wanting to do for years, but we kept forgetting about it until October was already upon us. But it's here, it's finished, and we couldn't be happier. To keep up with the Digital Dream Club, you can follow us on Blue Sky and Twitter at DigiDreamClub, and we have a Discord server linked in the description below. If you'd like to tip us for our efforts, you can find our Ko-fi page in the description as well, or contribute directly through YouTube. Have a wonderful night, a happy Halloween, and may your soul remain sound forevermore.